<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, March 14th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, there is a little bit of a delay in setting up the um, the screen, the agenda that you'll see on the screen. The system had to reboot, so do bear with us for a moment. In the meantime, let's begin with a roll call. Supervisor Arenas is absent today. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Sumidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Good morning, here. President Ellenberg? I'm here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Oops. Turn off your phones, everyone. Um, the Pledge of Allegiance today, um, have the Supervisor Chavez, would you lead, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll turn to Supervisor Lee to introduce this morning's invocator, Dr. Mohammed Nadin. Good morning. Um, I'm honored this morning to invite uh, the invocation by Imam Fuad Mohammed from the Muslim Community Association. Um, this is actually a change of program, but earlier we have asked uh, Dr. Mohammed Nadim, uh, but in this case we have, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Mr. Mohammed uh, from Imam Mohammed, uh, and uh, also Ms. Karim to be here from the MCA. In celebration of the start of Ramadan on March 22nd, 2023, today's invocation is presented to you by Ms. Karim, who is the Vice President of the Muslim Community Association, and Imam Fuad Mohammed. If I could ask you both to make your way to the dais, please. The Muslim Community Association, MCA, is the largest Islamic institution in California with multiple facilities that operate schools and mosques in the Santa Clara County. MCA Vice President Masbah Karim has 25 years of engineering experience that has been associated with MCA since the early 1990s. Imam Fawad Muhammad is a resident Islamic scholar and offers classes at mosques throughout the Bay Area. A native of Seattle, Imam Muhammad graduated from the University of Washington with a double major in community psychology and educational studies and a minor in policy studies. He pursued Islamic studies at premier Islamic institutions. Thank you very much for both of you to be here today. Thank Good morning. You, thank you, Supervisor Lee, for the invitation. I would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for on behalf of MCA Muslim Community Association and I'll uh, offer Imam Fuad to be for the invocation. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings and peace to every single one of you, those that are listening and those that are sitting in front of us. Thank you to Supervisor Lee for having us come here and the rest of the uh, supervisors here. Um, let us pray. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Oh Allah, we humbly request and beseech you to bless this gathering in this board of supervisors. We ask that you shower this gathering with your mercy and your guidance. Grant them the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to make just and equitable decisions that reflect the needs and aspirations of the people that they serve. We ask you to bless this city of ours, this county, and this country. We ask that you make this chamber a beacon of hope and justice and a beacon of righteousness for the entire country. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have one adjournment in memoriam today, and I'll turn again to Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Allenberg. Today we are adjourning our meeting in honor memory of Hong Duk Lai. Hong Duk Lai was born on February 13, 1947, and passed away on February 12, 2023. He has served the Vietnamese American community for over 45 years. For the past three decades, Hong Lai worked with others to host the Tet Festival at the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds, developing it into the largest Tet Festival with over 30,000 people participating every year. The festival opened the door for other ethnicities to share the culture as well. He was very active in educating young Vietnamese Americans about the culture, preserving traditions, and keeping the Vietnamese culture vibrant in our community. Hong allowed youth to continue advocating for freedom, 
Democracy, and Human Rights of Vietnam by creating the Freedom Torque Relay from San Francisco to the Tet Festival in the Santa Clara Fairground. In 1977, he co-founded the Coalition of Nationalist Vietnamese Organizations of Northern California, comprised of 54 organizations to better serve the Vietnamese American community. Hong was married to Mrs. Ta Sun Mai in 1973. They had one son, two daughters, and his family is here today, I believe. Um, yes, would you like to say a few words? Or your... Uh, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for having us today. Uh, thank you especially to the District 3 staff and Supervisor Vice President Otto Lee for this opportunity to share with you a little of who my dad was behind all the Vietnamese community work that he, he was mainly known for. He brought a lot of people together in strength and identity. Um, but maybe what was not talked about as often was that my dad was a very strong family-oriented man. He worked consistently to remind and instill that the bonds of a family are made through sacrifice and commitment. Although he was always busy with work, with all these jobs and insane projects, he would still prioritize fam time for family members, for family events and members. It gave him joy and probably a lot of relief to have his parents, his in-laws, his siblings, and all the kids hanging out and growing up together. It made him proud that our clan was so big this large dynamic that also possessed a lot of traditional structures as many cultures have. It naturally forced us to quickly learn that although we may all have differences in opinion on many subjects, we still have to figure out how to, how we still have to figure out acceptance and respect for one another in order to operate daily and to be able to live peacefully. This is one of many gifts my dad, from my dad that I will carry the rest of my life that there is always something to achieve that is bigger than yourself or any circle you would like to define yourself to be within. My dad was committed to excellence, had a lot of ingenuity and creativity, and maintained high expectations of himself throughout his entire life. When most of us couldn't see the pathway of one of his goals, my dad had the vision and, and determination to follow through with all his plans. There was never any hesitation for him to be heading into uncharted waters. Although a man that driven can be a challenging father, he really did always value his family and community more than anything else, including himself. I think that he is with us in this room right now. This is the ultimate. I can feel him being so proud that right now there is a collection of his loved ones, his peers, his community, and its leaders together, either hearing about him for the first time or showing appreciation and recognition to him. What an honor. Our family is so thankful for your time here today to acknowledge my dad, to celebrate the people of your community, and most of all, we are thankful to have such a loving and caring man in our lives. Thank you. I love you, Dad. Thank you. <clears throat> we thank you, Supervisor Lee and Board of Supervisor representing District 3 for this time and opportunity to honor our dad. As you all heard here today, my dad devoted his life to serving his home country, Vietnam, and a prominent leader in the Vietnamese, Asia, or the Vietnamese American community across the state of California. It was through his legacy that I continue to be inspired to serve our marginalized communities. I've been a proud member of one of the largest nonprofit mental health organizations in California for 14 years, Pacific Clinics. And in 2019, I started a private practice that specialized in providing mental health services, particularly to the BIPOC community. And it was my dad who stood by my side, as he always has to help lead and advocate our, for our communities. Many of us here know Hung Lai as a prominent and passionate community leader. To us, he was also a family-oriented, compassionate, and loving father. He was our biggest supporter no matter what we wanted to do and aspire in life. He taught us that vulnerability and strength go hand in hand. And that though he made a lot of sacrifices to serve this community, he will always be remembered not only for his passion, love, and for love for his country, leadership, and activism, but also being an incredible father who has always shown unconditional love and support to us. We continue to honor your legacy, Dad. We thank you, this district, the Board of Supervisors, and this community for decades of support for our Vietnamese community, Vietnamese American community, and for spending the time today to honor our dad. Thank you. Come on, thank you very much for sharing moments with us on this. May I add just one? Please. 
if you don't mind. One, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the family coming out today. I know these are hard, you know, hard experiences, but it really is an honor to say um, to all of you a thank you to your to your father because, you know, bringing people together in our community, especially given how diverse it is, is really really important. And recognizing, um, as you have in terms of the work that you've done to support the community also, um, that kind of generous leadership is so needed in a community like ours. So I'm so sorry very much for your loss, and I just want to honor him and say thank you. Many, many, many of us have spent time at many events that he put together, so thank you. Thank you, colleagues, and uh, my condolences as well. What beautiful words from daughters about their father, and I, I can't imagine for a parent a, a higher honor. So may his memory always be for a blessing. Item five is commendations and proclamations. We have no presentations to make today. We'll have a number to approve uh, on the consent calendar, and I do just want to thank my, uh, my colleagues for directing the the presentations and proclamations to our Monday uh, first meeting of the month um, opportunities where we can really celebrate in a more relaxed manner. So thank you for that. Item six is public comment. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on any item not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the board. And we will take public speakers in the, in the chambers first and then look to see if we have speakers on Zoom. And for speakers who are joining us remotely, if you intend to speak on public comment, please raise your hands, your virtual hands now. We will cut, we will close the, the list of public speakers on Zoom when the first person has begun speaking. So not limiting by number. If you intend to speak, please, please join now. Thank you. Do we have speakers in the chamber? I currently have one speaker in the chamber. And do we have speakers online? And I have two speakers on Zoom. All right, uh, let's do two minutes, please. All right. Our first speaker is Mark Trout. Right. Um, I uh, remember when Chuck Reed was the mayor, I asked him to just completely dispense with the uh, invocation because I believe God is honored more to just ignore him completely than have the false religions come up here and appeal to uh, the Almighty, such as the Muslims, the unbelieving Jews, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and all of the rest of the false religions. See, Jesus has no competitor. He resurrected from the grave the third day. And to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. And we acknowledge that we were one nation under God, but we really don't believe that. We are. We're one nation under God. Now, uh, I'd like to say, I wish I had two hours, but uh, we are coming up to the new year. Nissan 1 will begin on the 28th, I believe. And that will be the beginning of the Sabbath year. And uh, it's quite fascinating that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed on a Sabbath year both times on the exact same day. There were precisely 84 cycles between the two, and there's 84 months in a cycle. Let me say that again. There were precisely 84 cycles between the two destructions of Jerusalem, and there's obviously 84 months in a cycle. Now, the reason why most Jews and Christians even don't understand this is they fail on two accounts. Number one, they don't understand the 70 weeks starts with uh, King Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1. And number two, they don't understand there were uh, 69 weeks of years uh, to the anointing of Christ in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which corresponds on our Gregorian calendar to what we call the year 2829. And because of these two mistakes, they don't realize there were 84 cycles between the two. But I'm really thinking Jesus is going to return sometime in this Sabbath year. You have to be born again to be ready. Have additional speakers joined on Zoom? We do. We actually have, we had two join after. I have four now. Perfect. Should we, we'll take them and we'll cut it off after Absolutely. the four. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Our first speaker is Karen. 
Karen, we are unmuting you. Please accept the unmute, and you will have two minutes to speak. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, I'd like to speak in regards to COVID-19. Um, California has rescinded the public health emergency, yet we're still living under public health orders. These need to be rescinded immediately. Um, we're still required to mask in healthcare settings, even though masking is very uncomfortable for many people. Uh, many people experience anxiety when their faces are masked and they're not allowed to seek out health care under these conditions. Um, furthermore, the public health order is strongly encouraging schools and businesses to require a COVID vaccine. Now, uh, many colleges like Foothill, De Anza, Stanford, they are still requiring the COVID vaccine and booster. This makes no sense. The booster only protects for possibly a month or two, and then the risk of COVID infection is the same or greater than an unvaccinated person. So there is really no public health benefit to uh, requiring these inoculations. This should be rescinded immediately. Right now, there are students that have been in forced quarantine. They haven't been to in-person school because of these public health orders. The colleges say they're just following the public health um, guidance, okay? So they've been in isolation for three years without being able to attend in person. This is completely inhumane. The public health guidelines need to be changed immediately. Um, furthermore, there's questions about some of the data that's on the public health website regarding the efficacy of the COVID vaccine. Um, there have been several statisticians like Igor Chudov who've done analysis and... Thank you. Our next speaker is Francesca. Francesca, we are unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. Francesca, are you able to unmute? All right, we'll move forward to B. Beekman. Am I unmuted? Oh, there you are, Francesca, you sure are. Okay, may I still speak? Yes. Thank you. I came today because I'm an unhoused advocate and I've been very fortunate enough to be able to pick up supplies from Office of Supportive Housing um, to distribute necessary items to our unhoused. Um, been very fortunate to be even able to pick up tents. That is a very unusual supply, and I encourage you to continue to supply those. It's the most necessary item they need. But today I bring to your attention that when I requested 50 blankets, after picking them up and before I distributed them, I don't, I just found this warning on the blanket and it says cancer and reproductive harm www.p65warnings.ca.gov. So I thought, well, that's not good. So I contacted um, the person that I requested the blankets from and she said, well, just go ahead and dispose of them and I'll talk to my team. Well, you know, 50 blankets isn't gonna fit in my little trash can. So I eventually, drove them back to the Office of Supportive Housing. And unfortunately, they wouldn't take them back from me. And they wouldn't even admit if they had a dumpster. They were telling me to go find a dumpster. But today, I just want it known that I've made several phone calls, sent emails, and I've gotten no reply. And so I'm requesting that somebody here please follow up with Office of Supportive Housing and find out that they have recalled because we do sign out for any items received. They do have a list. So we're not distributing this. Um, and also, it wasn't worth the money. It is so lightweight, you can see through it. So it's not um, a very good product to be out in our environment. And I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is B. Beekman. Hi, we're Beekman here. 
I'm in the train station and I have to uh, run quickly to get out of the way of a My apologies, I accidentally muted Blair, sorry. Oh, hi, I'm back. Uh, can I have a Was bit of time? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm at a train station, so uh, there's a little bit of noise here, sorry. Um, I guess I had, I just wanted to go over my usual list um, of things that are important to myself uh, at this time for Santa Clara County. I hope you're uh, working on the uh, public meeting issue. Uh, with Zoom meetings, and then we can be able to have a full array of uh, commission meetings and committee meetings available on Zoom again. Really good luck in those efforts. A really good luck to work on the closed meeting, excuse me, public process, that um, I really think, uh, you know, you can add a few simple words to your closed meeting agenda items to really describe what the meetings are going through, and that it can offer an incredible amount of additional transparency and accountability that's really, really, really needed for the closed meeting uh, session agenda items. You have a tradition to really specifically not offer any words uh, about your closed meeting sessions that is rare in uh, local government practices. I don't know why you have that tradition. I think we have to really examine that tradition. Um, I, I, I guess my other big point, I, I had a few other things, is that uh, I really hope you will work on uh, cybersecurity issues to make that an open public process with open public policies. Um, that, those are the ways to really address the concepts of war and, and really work that the surveillance tech things, ordinance ideas or ideas of open democracy that works towards peace and our better human reasoning. With cybersecurity, open public policies, we'd be addressing the Ukraine war basically and asking for concepts of uh, peace and good dialogue. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And our final speaker who had his raise, hand raised before we started was Humberto Nava Carpenters. We are unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. We, there we go. You should be able to speak now. Um, it looks like they're unable to speak for some reason. We do have one additional speaker that raised their hand. All right, we we'll go ahead and accept um, Chris Martinez. We are asking you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Martinez. I'm a carpenter with the Northern California Carpenters Union over here in local 405. I'm here to talk to you today about carpenter area wages and benefit standards. As a construction worker who has worked out in the field for the last decade plus, I can't express to you how important it is to make sure that the men and women that build our great city are taken care of. A lot of times we are underpaid, overworked, and have no help. I'm not saying all contractors are bad, but a lot of contractors care more about what they make instead of how their workers live. Uh, if we could hold these contractors and developers to a higher standard that would ensure that the workers will make a wage they can live a decent life with and not worry of having to work paycheck to paycheck. Words like prevailing wage, healthcare, and apprenticeship should be the norm for these jobs. Local hires should also be important to make sure that men and women working in our town will also be buying goods in our town and that will help our city with its tax revenue. Every building we walk into and street we drive down was built by a construction worker and it's time we stop being abused by these contractors and start being rewarded for our hard work, long hours that we put in so we all can enjoy our lives. It, it upsets me that these workers can build these houses, condos and malls, but yet we can't afford to live or shop in them. So with that, please think about holding these developers and contractors to the standard so we can all live a better life. Thank you, guys. And that concludes our speakers.
Thank you. Item seven is to approve the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. Let's start with a review of where we stand now. All right. I do have that and I have a couple of announcements as well. All right, so first we have a request from President Ellenberg to add item number nine to the consent calendar. Item number nine, consider recommendations relating to permit fee relief for small businesses impacted by COVID-19. There's a correction to item number 14. This item should read as follows. Item number 14, adopt resolution officially recognizing the Muigma Ohlone tribe and supporting the tribe in its efforts to secure federal recognition as an Indian tribe by the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs. Request from President Ellenberg to hold item number 25 to April 4th, 2023. Item number 25 is to consider recommendations relating to follow-up from the Board of Supervisors strategic planning session of January, 2023. Request from President Ellenberg to consider item number 26 after item number 10. Correction to item number 10B, action I, should reflect a requirement for a four-fifths roll call vote. Item number 26, receive quarterly report relating to the Heading Home campaign. Item number 10, public hearing, fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan for community development block grant and home investment partnership act funds item number 10 b i approve request for appropriation modification number 168 for three million five hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred and sixty six dollars increasing revenue and expenditures in the office of supporting house supportive housing budget relating to implementing the home american rescue plan funds, four-fifths vote. Request from President Ellenberg to add item 29 to the consent calendar. Item number 29, consider recommendations relating to a guaranteed basic income pilot program for unhoused high, high school students. Request from administration to hold item number 31 to April 4th, 2023. Item number 31, receive report from Emergency Medical Services Agency relating to additional funding to address distracted driving outreach and education. Correction to item number 41, the item should read as follows. Item number 41, approve agreement with Emergency Physicians Associates, San Jose PC, relating to providing emergency department, express care clinic, and urgent care clinic physician staffing services in an amount not to exceed $51,465,960 for period March 14th, 2023 through June 30th, 2028 with one five-year extension option that has been reviewed and approved by county council as to form and legality. Request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 42 from the consent calendar to be considered with item number 20. Item number 42 is to approve retroactive Fourth Amendment to agreement with Rural Metro of California, Inc. relating to providing inter-facility emergency ambulance transportation services, increasing the maximum contract amount by $1,200,000 from $10,633,334 to $11,833,334 and extending the agreement for a 24th month period through June 30th, 2024. Item number 20 is to adopt a resolution making certain findings and adopting a written policy regarding ambulance services contracts pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 1797.230, Assembly Bill 389. There's a request from President Nallenberg to remove items number 52 and 53 from the consent calendar. Item number 52 is to approve job specifications and amend classification plan to add classifications of crisis Intervention Specialist and Associate Crisis Intervention Specialist. Item number 53 is to 
the adoption of the salary ordinance number NS 5.23.139, deleting nine, psychiatric social worker two, or marriage and family therapist two, or marriage and family therapist one, or psychiatric social worker one positions, and 11, psychiatric social worker two, or marriage and family therapist two, or marriage and family therapist one, or psychiatric social worker one, or rehabilitation counselor positions, and adding 20 crisis intervention specialist or associate crisis intervention specialist positions in the Behavioral Health Services Department and amending the salary schedule to add the classification of associate crisis intervention specialist and crisis intervention specialist. Request from President Ellenberg to remove item number 66 from the consent calendar. Item number 66 is to consider recommendations relating to the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget process. Request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 83 from the consent calendar. Item number 83 is to consider recommendations relating to the Race and Health Disparities Community Board. Request from Supervisor Sumidian to remove item number 84 from the consent calendar. Item 84 is to adopt a resolution ratifying the March 8th proclamation of local emergency by the Director of Emergency Services relating to winter rain and snowstorm conditions. Items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any parties or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And finally, I have an oral summary of changes to compensation or benefits for certain local agency executives. Ordinance number NS20.22.08 was approved on first reading on February 28, 2023 but will not be finally approved until it is approved before a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting under item number 121. Pursuant to government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the proposed salary adjustments that are required to be disclosed. NS-20.22.08 increases the flat rate salaries of the assessor district attorney and sheriff by 0.8940% effective on and after April 13th, 2023, or 30 days after the date of final ordinance adoption, whichever is later. The new bi-weekly salary for the assessor position is $10,529.13. The new biweekly salary for the district attorney position is $15,279.08. The new biweekly salary for the sheriff position is $12,853.87. And this concludes my report. Extraordinarily well done. Thank you, Rhonda. <laughs> um, I have a You'll be not thrilled to hear a few additional changes, but I'll look first to my colleagues for any. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Ellenberg and Rhonda. I'm sorry you have to do that. Um, okay, so on item 83, I had pulled this from consent um, because uh, the, the board is having a difficult time meeting quorum. And I know this is an important community board, uh, Susan, that you recommended be created. And I know that there's work being done um, really to help. I mean, it's actually been really effective if it could meet. So the group has failed to meet quorum twice because of the new law becoming effective that members must be present rather than um, meet remotely. And so I'm very interested in making sure that the intergovernment relations team um, is including information on bills that have been introduced in Sacramento that may impact the current rules. Um, so I, I can give examples. I know all of you are watching that. And so my, the second reason I was interested, and I could put it back, is just to better understand um, through uh, Greta and the clerk of the board, Tiffany, 
if there's any update on the board's request that we receive information and recommendations to expand the number of meetings at which members of the public can participate remotely. I'll defer to the clerk of the board on that. And board members, after um, Tiffany speaks, uh, County Council may have an update on some pending legislation relevant to that question. Good morning, Supervisors. Tiffany Lanier, Clerk of the Board. Yes, so uh, we have been working with County Council and County Departments to determine uh, what we're able to do in terms of not only uh, local laws, but also in terms of uh, capabilities within um, county meeting spaces. So we're talking about infrastructure to support uh, hybrid meetings. And then again, like I said, we are um, looking at pending legislation to see uh, how that, how the legislation is voted. I'll wait for county council and then I'll give some feedback. On the legislative front, there are a few different bills uh, that are pending that may address this. It looks like there'll probably be one vehicle that moves forward, which is uh, AB 817. It would allow um, subsidiary bodies like advisory commissions uh, to meet fully remotely. Um, we're looking at that language. We expect that there'll be amendments and updates and we'll know more in a few weeks. Um, that bill would take effect presumably January 1st of next year um, and uh, provide a very different legal framework that would allow these bodies to meet fully remotely by Zoom like they did uh, during the pandemic. And we are, we are tracking it and monitoring it. Thank you. I think, um so a couple things I wanted to make sure. At a previous meeting, um, uh, Tiffany, I think you all talked about needing more resources. And I had asked, and I just want to reinforce that we're going to get a report prior to us going into budget hearings. And I think we're, when do we begin budget hearings? I should know that. The hearings are in June, the workshops are in May. So I, I would just want to make sure that by the beginning of April that we have a full assessment of what the resource requirements are so Absolutely. that they can be considered as part of budget. I think we have to anticipate that there are going to be changes um, in state law, but in the, in the interim, um, this has become sort of really more urgent for some of our boards and commissions. So um, I would just like to ask that that come to us at the first week off agenda, beginning of April, so that, and that that be relayed fully to the staff. And any budget requests that you've made through um, your office to the, um, the uh, county executive also be attached to that referral. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, and, then, and then we can put it back on consent. I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that. On item nine, um, Supervisor Ellenberg has asked that we put that on consent, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, if we can add that the, we amend the motion to extend the MECO waiver of fees to 12 months after the program becomes available rather than the 2023 calendar year because it really should start when, when um, those businesses are, can avail themselves of it. It sounds fine. I just want to see if there's any impact with availab availability of funds or other deadlines that we may be working um, toward that would limit our flexibility. No. Happy to include that. Great. Thank you. Um, I was going to see if I could put one more thing on consent. You'll have to come back to me. <laughs> Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, let me begin with um, an acknowledgement or an indication that I share Supervisor Chavez's concerns about um, providing fuller access to the greatest degree possible. And I'll just very briefly say I think you know, there were very few silver linings over the last three years, but one of them was that we discovered ways to open up the process to more folks. 
and we've talked about that in the past, and this is consent, so I won't belabor the point, but I just, I know sometimes staff is anxious to know if a concern is shared more broadly, uh, and I just wanted to say, as I've said in the past, uh, I still think this is a important consideration, and I hope we'll wrestle, a bit closer to the hope we'll wrestle it to the ground. Uh, that being said, we have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. Specifically, we have been advised that items 36, 37, 41, 42, 45, 46, 47, 49, 68, 69, 76, 78, 79, 80, 91, 92, 93, 95, 98, 99, and 106 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. So I wanna ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings as defined by the Levine Act has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board of, uh, board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Lean Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much and I will also be an abstention on item 121. Again, an abstention on item 121. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, do you have any comments? Excellent. <sighs> Supervisor Chavez, you wanted me to come back to you, or you're good? I wanted to wait until after you. Okay. Supervisor Simidian, your light is still on. All right, thank you. Um, I too, Rhonda, would like to abstain on item 121, please. That's the salary ordinance. I want to hold item 14 to a date uncertain. Uh, I did previously ask um, to hold item 25, the follow-up to the January board priority setting session, and I just want to provide some, some context for that request. As we don't yet have the updated referral matrix directed at the January priority setting session, I'd like to hold this item until April so we can address all direction from the supervisors together in one discussion. In the meantime, I would encourage my colleagues to share any remaining comments or prioritization of your referrals with the CEO's office so that they can complete their work for April. I'd also like to ask administration when this report comes back to provide more detailed context on how they've drafted the expected accomplishments to reflect both administration and board priority activities and propose some type of a uh, system level metric that we can all use to objectively track outcomes in these priority areas rather than just completion of the proposed activities. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I had asked to pull items 52 and 53, but would now like to hold those items until April 4th. I absolutely feel urgency to increase compensation and define a clearer scope of duties for the mobile crisis team to distinguish them from staff working in this clinic settings. But as the ledge file indicates, there are still active discussions with SEIU that I'd like to allow time to resolve uh, before, the, before this comes before the board. And there are two items I would also recommend that staff look at between now and the next meeting. The first is how the, propo the new proposed salary range compares to our contract and mobile crisis teams, in particular the trust program as this board has expressed an intent to expand that program and maximize the use of this level of response wherever appropriate. And second, the current proposed new classification of crisis intervention specialist is defined as follows, quote, under general supervision to provide community-based service, community-based crisis intervention services on mobile crisis teams to adult to children and adult populations experiencing mental health and our substance use crises, including direct client contact in the community, 
partnering with law enforcement, crisis intervention, field clinical assessments, outreach services, and to de-escalate situations involving the most vulnerable populations in the county. I, I'd like to see this language amended to reflect that CIS would partner with law enforcement as circumstances require, rather than the very broad language that suggests that law enforcement uh, will consistently uh, and constantly partner in the field response activities. Um, item 49, hold on one second here. Oh, in, on item 49, the, the ledge file stated, due to resignations and retirements of psychiatrists during the past several months, the county health system has not been able to adequately staff inpatient consultation services and inpatient psychiatric service, uh, services. I'd like to request an off-agenda report on this item that provides a list of the county psychiatrist positions by department and location of services provided, jail, BAP, et cetera, and noting all vacancies. Second, the general utilization of contract psychiatrists in each service location. And third, details and timelines on the strategies for addressing the workforce shortage, specifically psychiatric shortages, psychiatry shortages referenced in the report. Uh, finally, item 66 is the schedule for the budget workshops in May. I had requested that we pull the item from consent, but I'm hoping to leave, leave it on consent if the, if the direction I'm about to offer can be approved on consent. I'd like to change the schedule so that day two will include the Health and Hospital Committee and CFSC. Then that will leave day three to include Public Health, Public Safety and Justice, as well as Hewlett Committee. And I understand that this is the way the board previously heard these items before my time on the board. And it makes sense to me. I think that it balances the time better. So looking to County Council, is this direction that can be added on the consent calendar? Yes. All right. Then with those changes and others mentioned by my colleagues, I would move approval of the consent the, calendar. The board may wish to consider whether to hold item 121. It's up to the board, but if it's not held, the, the item will fail today. It lacks three affirmative votes. Right. Um, the, the, yeah, that was my question, actually, exactly, because of the fact that since we have one absence here, uh, even with two I votes, there's not enough vote to pass 121, and there's already uh, two abstentions right now. That's why you're That's suggesting correct. That's why I was suggesting if the board wishes, it may and instead which makes hold sense to me. yeah. uh, okay. item 121 to the next meeting. So is that your, your motion, Supervisor Lee? Uh, to incorporate into your motion. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any additional Supervisor Chavez than Supervisor Chavez? Was it on that point? Okay. So on item 49, um, I really appreciate the questions you're asking about the psychiatric staffing services. And um, I, I didn't hear if you asked specifically about um, the current recruitment strategy. Um, and what I would just ask is if that could be included as part of your requested information. I believe it does. My, my third direction, third item, was details and, st and timelines on the strategies for addressing workforce shortages, but happy to make specifically clear that that includes recruitment strategies. Yeah, and what Can I jump in here? Um, since there's so much discussion about issues, I'd suggest you leave it on the regular agenda so that we can try to address some of these issues today. Um, on item 49 um, specifically? It's yeah. currently on the consent calendar. Leave it on the regular calendar. Move it back to the, right. move it to the regular calendar. I'm just very concerned when, you know, something's on the agenda and then a whole lot of recommendations, modifications and information are asked during the consent discussion and there's no opportunity for staff to respond to any of them in real time. I'll pull so that from consent. I, I think yeah. in keeping with the board's direction in the past, if something's going to be discussed that is currently on the consent calendar, move it to the regular calendar. We will do that. Okay, move item 49. And then to go back to item 52 and 53, mm -hmm. um, 
I, I appreciate and I'm, I'm comfortable with the direction of making sure that the communication can be um, more robust with SEIU. I am concerned about some of the proposed changes in terms of scope of work depending on the, on the type of response we have. So on that front, what I'd like to ask to modify your request is that the staff give the option of that language that you, you requested relative to police engagement. So it's just better understood under what terms and conditions it would be used and relative to what bodies of work. Um, and then I'd be comfortable with the motion. The, the second issue in this area that I'm also very interested in understanding. Can you and, please explain? Well, the, what, what Supervisor Ellenberg requested was a different scope of work relative to those classifications in terms of when um, public safety is engaged or not engaged. It's a little bit more general than that, it, where the language says partnering with law enforcement, my request is to add the language, partnering with law enforcement where appropriate. Oh, okay. Oh, that, then I'm comfortable or with as, that. as circumstances require. Well, I was going to say where appropriate is a little more, to me, more comfortable. So I'm comfortable if you want to use that language. And, you know, when it comes back. But the other question that I just wanted to have staff bring back on this particular body of work is, something I raised at Public Safety and Justice, which in a number of areas, we have grants that were two or three years in length, and those grant times are coming up for some of the um, crisis intervention work overall. And I just wanna make sure we understand, I understand if any of those grants impede the, the um, services that are on the street, meaning that if a grant's ending, what are we doing in response to that? And I'm assuming not, I mean, I'm assuming we're still moving forward based on this action, but I just want to make sure I understand that when it comes back. Does that make sense, Dr. Smith? No. So right now. I mean, I'm just worried that, again, we're trying to debate something that's on the consent calendar as if it's on the regular calendar. Well, it's being deferred. And in fact, it's being held. Yeah, so you're holding should it. Should those... Should well, but it's being held, and then there's all these discussions about I want no, this, it's not I want a, it's, that. No, it's additional information so that when it comes back, it's not being held again. And so the additional information I want to understand is very simply this. We have currently, some of these positions are funded through grants. I want to understand what grants are ending so that I understand what the general fund uh, impact will be long term and what we are taking responsibility for in the future. I think those are all my comments. So is, uh, did someone second yeah, the motion? Yeah, did. Okay, thank yeah. you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. We have um, <clears throat> made a number of changes and then made a number of changes to our changes. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear uh, without going through the more formal reading of where we are on a couple of <clears throat> points as to what's on and what's off. Um, Item number nine uh, has been added to the consent calendar as things now stand, I believe, yes? Correct. And item number 14 has now been held indefinitely, yes? Correct. And item number 25. Held to date uncertain. If held to date uncertain, thank okay. you. And item 25 uh, has been held to our next meeting in April still. Mm -hmm. And Item 26 will still be heard after item number 10, yes? Yes. Okay. And you have still asked that we add item 29 to the consent calendar, yes? No? Yes. Item 29, yes. Okay. Uh, administration's holding item 31 still. And Supervisor Chavez had asked to remove item 42 from the consent to be considered with item number 20. Is that still the request before us? That's yes. my understanding. Okay. And then um, items 52 and 53 are now back on consent, as I understand no. it? No, nope, they're still held. Uh, item 52 and 53 was to remove them. And instead, I'm sorry, you said they've been held. Correct. Ah, thank you. Uh, so we, and then, um, Item 66 was to be removed, but now it's going to go back onto the consent? Correct. 
correct. Okay. And there had been a request to remove item 83 from consent, but I believe that's back on the regular uh, uh, place on consent. Okay. Uh, thank you. That, that helps me know what's... Clear as mud. Yeah, got it. Good. Thank, thank you. Do we have any public speakers on the consent calendar? I have... Uh, looks like I have two on Zoom. Do we have any in the chamber? Parts. All right, let's hear from the two speakers, please, at two minutes each. All right, our first speaker is B. Beekman. B, we've asked you to. Um, Blair, we've asked you to unmute. Please unmute, and you'll have two minutes to speak. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to speak to, if I can find it here, uh, items, um, I think it is uh, 20, 21 to about 24, the surveillance tech things. Um, I have a busy day today, and so I wanted to use my time at, at consent calendar time to speak to items uh, 20 to 24, 21 to 24 about uh, surveillance protections. Thank you that you are working on these things and that they have uh, inmate components to them, uh, working with the jail system. You know my big point that uh, with the biometric camera stuff within the jails, if you learn to make that as part of the ordinance itself, I think it's a really important concept to learn to do. Um, uh, it's my feeling, again, that uh, uh, Santa Clara County has a way to work the tech ordinance that they really basically want to inventory every single piece possible of, of surveillance and tech equipment. And uh, they're, they're making a concerted effort to do that more than in places like local cities like Berkeley and Oakland. So uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed with that concept, and I just hope you'll want to take the extra step to just want to basically inventory everything, <laughs> you know, and give it a good name, give it a good understanding for public understanding uh, and acknowledgement. And that's why I, I, I'm so strongly in belief that you can develop a good policy system for cybersecurity issues for the public to relate to that are concepts of peace and not war, basically which is the whole point of this work that we're doing and what open up democracy really develops as a community process. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is John. John, we're asking you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Uh, I have a comment regarding item number 96 on the consent calendar. Receive report from the Department of Planning and Development relating to the 2022 Annual Progress Report. This report is intended to demonstrate to the state that the county is producing housing in accordance with state law, yet the report for 2022 is full of errors. A quick scan of Table A, which is supposed to list entitlements granted for new housing developments, shows the department includes a remodel, an addition, and a livestock shelter counting all credits for single family homes. They additionally list one entry that was already counted in 21 and one entry that is an extension of an entitlement granted in a previous year. In all of the 25 single family homes taken credit for, five are incorrect. That's a 20% error rate. If the department had to manage a list of hundreds of entitlement applications a year, a few errors could be overlooked. But with so few projects getting approved, the department should be able to get this right. Similar errors exist in previous year's data already submitted to the HCE. I urge the supervisors to remove this item from the consent calendar and ask the planning department to produce an accurate progress report. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Connie Romo Ludwig. Connie, you have two minutes to speak. Good morning and thank you for uh, hearing me today. Um, I am um, wanting to speak on um, in regards to the grant that um, Santa Clara County issued to Cal Poly um, 
uh, during the pandemic about two years ago, probably, um, they presented to SAMPAC uh, their recommendations concerning San Martin traffic, downtown village, uh, other improvements. And um, just one to uh, bring to attention was the, the traffic. Uh, they suggested, I think, road humps um, along the, the rural roads. And, um, and I really would like to ask that you bring this back to SAMPAC and consider the improvements to our community. Um, for instance, I'm the first house from the corner on Monterey Road. People speed past our house at least 60 miles an hour. And actually the other day, one passed another vehicle right in front of my house. And it's very dangerous for uh, animals, people. Um, there's been deaths. And so I'd like to ask uh, that you uh, consider that. At our um, San Martin Neighborhood Association hosted a pancake breakfast fundraiser this past Sunday. Um, and one a resident um, came to me and asked that we would bring up the traffic. And on San Martin Avenue by the post office, um, she asked if perhaps uh, blinking crosswalks can be placed like in the downtown Morgan Hill area. So I'd like to ask please that you uh, pay strong attention to this. We really do desperately need uh, your assistance and I thank you so much for <coughs> coming out today on the rainy day to meet with us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. Sharon, you will have two minutes to speak. Good morning. Prior to speaking, um, I just wanted to clarify if um, the MECO is on the consent calendar. Um, should I be waiting to um, discuss item eight? Um, can you answer that for me, please? We'll turn to County Council to explain the procedures of public comment. The, the board doesn't respond to questions during public comment. I'll just note, though, that item eight is not on consent. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker will be Karina Geary. Karina, you'll have two minutes to speak. Hello, thank you for having me today. Um, I am calling today um, as a representative Tom, from the Tamiya Nation. We're the indigenous tribe of Santa Clara Valley. Um, we're speaking on item number 14. Um, the, uh, you know, as a matter of principle, Tamiya Nation supports the federal acknowledgement of all San Francisco Bay Area tribes, including the Muwekma Ohlone. However, we cannot support legislation or any other types of, you know, proclamations that assigns our Aboriginal territory in Santa Clara Valley to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We cannot support any legislation that assigns the counties in that region to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe's service area as well. The Muwekma Ohlone tribe's own documentation and their federal and the petition for federal acknowledgement locates their Aboriginal territory in the San Francisco East Bay, specifically Pleasanton, California. Furthermore, the Muwekma Ohlone tribe presents evidence in identifying Muwekma descendants in only four counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. Despite this, the Muwekma Ohlone tribe continues to claim Aboriginal territories with a corresponding service area inclusive of 13 counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. This expansive claim erases the continued existence of other San Francisco Bay Area tribes, including the Tamiya Nation. If legislations were to identify the entire area as Aboriginal territory and service area of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, it would make it more difficult for Tamiya Nation and other local tribes to attain federal acknowledgement, undermining our ability to acquire lands within our own Aboriginal homeland under the present status of Cal as a California Native American tribe, and potentially deny our human rights to repatriate and rebury our ancestors under the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. So we implore you to do a little bit more research um, to reach out to the other tribes in the area um, before this proclamation is approved. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. Let's take a vote on the, in a moment. Supervisor Lee. I have a question before we take a vote. Um, on the uh, hearing just now, we heard that item non number 96, there might be some uh, potential uh, minor changes that might need to be made to make it correct. So I'm gonna ask County Council or staff, uh, Dr. Smith, is there any urgency to pass 96 today?
Or you can just take it off consent. Yeah, I don't think I can answer that question. Uh, maybe we can take it off consent. And have okay. Yeah, we'll just take off consent, and we have staff to uh, elaborate later, or we might be able to hold it uh, for a meeting or so if it's not urgent. Thank you. And that's 96. Planning. 96. So we'll get planning down here to Please. explain. Please. Thank you. Okay. May I ask a follow-up? Of course. Um, Supervisor or President Ellenberg, um, there was a comment about a, a roadway, public safety in South in South County, and um, and I I didn't hear the item that was referred to there, and I was wondering if any of my colleagues did. It was a public speaker. I don't recall for sure. That may have been the speaker who referenced a series of. Item numbers. I thought one of our speakers referenced items in the 20s. I, I can't recall if that's the precise one there. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sure Supervisor Ellenberg's, I mean, I'm sorry, Supervisor Adanas's staff is listening, so I'll, I'll leave it to them to do the follow up. I, I just wanted to make sure, since she wasn't here, that if there was something uh, urgent and if her staff could alert us if it is uh, during the day, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We are ready to vote on the consent calendar. <coughs> Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Point of personal privilege. Do we no longer require the clerk to reread all that information? Or am I. Um, it would probably be helpful for staff just to make sure we've got everything, if that's okay. And let's okay. absolutely do that. All right, so I, I show that 9 and 29 were put on consent. I show that 20, 42, 49, 84, and 96 were removed from consent. And I show that 14, 25, 31, 52, 53, and 121 were held. Well, that being the case, I'm prepared to be an I vote. Awesome. With an abstention on 121 as indicated earlier, but no longer relevant because we're continuing the item. Great. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item eight is our first public hearing, this one on micro enterprise home kitchen operation permit fees. And I believe we will hear from the public health folks. Welcome. Good morning, Madam President, Supervisors. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Rudman with the Public Health Department, and we in the Department of Environmental Health are pleased to present item eight to you, which creates a pathway for our community members to operate micro enterprise home kitchens while also ensuring the safety of their products and the health of their customers. So I'm joined today by Dr. Marilyn Underwood, our Director of our Environmental Health, uh, Department of Environmental Health, and her colleagues to answer any questions. Thank you. Good morning. Nope. Oh. Good morning. Oh, Good morning. There we go. <laughs> Catching on here. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Ellenberg and Board of Supervisors. I'm here joined with me today. There's been quite a crew of people working on it. Today I have joined with me uh, Beatrice Santiago, who is currently working out of class as our Consumer Protection Director and also uh, Jonathan Rubin, who is a program manager in the Consumer Protection Division, along with County uh, Deputy County Counsel Sonia Wills, who's behind me. Um, before you today is the uh, fee resolution for the MECOS, Micro Enterprise Home Kitchens, which are uh, a term for allowing uh, limited uh, cooking and serving and preparing of food as restaurant style, if, you, if we want, or delivery. Uh, in establishing this fee, this would be a, uh, going along with the ordinance that you just approved on consent, item number 122. Um, the fee is to, for the annual permit, which is to uh, allow us, we are allowed to go and inspect one time a year in these facilities. Uh, it will allow us also, we want to do this in cooperation with them. We want to be able to have a phone call with them, make sure the folks know what we're looking for, what to expect when we come to do the inspection, and to set a time when they're actually cooking. Because again, uh, we want to really make sure that we help them uh, do this in the best food safety uh, method. 
Uh, so that's what the establishment of this fee and also consultation during the year as needed. Um, we will, I, even though you're passing the fee today, we are going to be applying the um, relief fees that you just also passed on consent item number nine so that these fees would not be applied for this uh, first year or getting us uh, up and running uh, so that we hopefully can encourage as many as possible to get going um, and to uh, start this uh, business and help out with the community. Uh, with that, I, I did submit a presentation, but I really don't feel unless you have questions, I need to show that presentation. It's mostly about what is a micro enterprise home kitchen and this item is mostly about the fee, but uh, welcome to take any questions you might have. We'll look to colleagues for questions and then public comment. Uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I First of all, I just wanted to say um, it was a pleasure to meet um, Dr. Dr. Underwood um, at, you know, out in the community. The first time I met uh, her is when we were out in the community learning about Mikos, and I want to say what a great sign I think that is um, for the future of the department. Um, and so I just wanted to move approval. Second. Terrific. Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak? I do have two members. Our first member, um, oh, we have three. Just a reminder, please raise your hands if you want to do public speaking. Once we begin speaking, we will no longer receive additional requests. If the list is still growing, let's give it a, a couple of seconds. All right, it looks like we may be holding it up. That's why we do this. Where are we? It's still growing, that's fine. Um, it looks, anybody else? All right, looks like we've got four. Okay, we'll, All we'll right. hold we'll it at four, start two with minutes each. Abigail Hinson. Abigail, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Good morning, Board of Supervisors and Board President. My name is Abigail Heinzen, and I am the Advocacy Manager at Vegilution and part of the CISA Puede Collective. I'm here today in support of the Microenterprise Home Kitchen Operation, and I want to start by thanking Supervisor Cindy Chavez for championing MECO at the county level. We really appreciate your support. Um, I did want to bring attention to the fees for the MECO program. The fee for a permit will be $635, and there's also a proposed first-time application fee of $340, which brings the total fees to start this home business model to $975. At VeggieLution, we know that many entrepreneurs will struggle to pay for these fees, but we also know that the Department of Environmental Health needs to ensure that they're able to meet their operating costs. We were so excited to hear of the temporary and emergency fee relief proposed on today's agenda. In addition, we look forward to working together with the Board of Supervisors and the Department of Environmental Health to find innovative and equitable ways to ensure that low-income small business entrepreneurs have consistent access to fee waiver or reduction programs for the long term. Thank you so much again for your support of the MECO pilot program, and we look forward to continuing to work with you regarding small business resources. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Soitza Del Rio. We've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. Soitza, are you able to accept the unmute? Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Buenos días, mi nombre es Oitza del Real y soy navegante comunitario en Bellilution. Hoy estoy aquí por parte de Elvia Hernández para leer su testimonio. Ella dice, buenos días, mi nombre es Elvia Hernández, vivo en el este de San José y estoy orgullosamente siendo parte del programa de ISA y Ground que nos impulsa a emprender nuestros propios negocios. Estoy aquí para pedir que aprueben la ley MICO, ya que es una oportunidad para poder abrir mi negocio en casa para apoyar a mi ingreso familiar. Quiero tener un negocio en casa porque a la misma vez puedo atender a mi negocio y también cuidar de mis hijos. Puedo tener mi propio horario y tener más... Did we lose that caller? Soitza, are you still there? Yes. 
Could we get a translation, please, of the comment she was able to share? There, I think oh, she's back. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ahora que soy parte de Isa y Graum, comparto con muchas madres de familia que tienen la misma necesidad de poder cocinar en casa y vender legalmente. Por esta razón, su aprobación de esta ley de MICO haría grandes cambios a nuestra comunidad. Pedimos que, pedimos que las tarifas de los permisos para el programa MICO sean accesibles y asequibles para que las familias puedan beneficiarse de este programa. Muchas gracias, miembros del Consejo, por todo su apoyo. Rosario, are you available? Yes. Thank you. Yes, good morning, and my name is Soitzia del Real, and I come here to, let, to read a testimony from a partner whose name is El Elvia Hernandez, who's not able to come here. And she says the following. I live in East San Jose, and I'm proudly part of Eastia Grow, which is able to open and launch businesses. And I'm really hoping this MICO law is, is approved because it allows me to have operations and an operation running in my house. I'm able to have a business and I'm also able to address my family. I'm able to address my kids. And also to, with Easy Grow, I'm able to have a business at home. I'm able to uh, sell legally and cook. I'm able to cook at home and sell legally. And now that I'm being part of this program, I'm also realizing that I'm sharing all these needs with different mothers and different families. So this is allowing us to, uh, as I said before, to cook and sell legally. So this is a very big and huge change in the community. And please, I only ask you for have very economic rates and to make everything very accessible to different programs, uh, to, to, to this program, and to have different access to different programs for it, and the families are getting benefit to from this program. So I thank you very much, Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Luna. We've asked you to unmute. Please unmute. Looks like Sharon may have dropped off for a moment. Oh, no. Good morning, supervisors. This is Sharon Luna, and I'm calling it as a San Martin resident. I do apologize. I've been dealing with some uh, flooding, so please bear with me. Um, well, the MECO program is a wonderful concept. It should be up to the potential applicant, not taxpayers who enter, uh, who enter new business concept to pay the required fees. The 140,000 being allocated for a waiver is a small amount. Still, this money is being taken away from already struggling existing small businesses, Santa Clara County departments and taxpayers. Supervisors would like you to consider a payment plan instead of fee waivers. It is essential that taxpayer dollars are spent carefully and wisely. I also would like to see as far as how the county is going to manage the possible increase in complaints. Um, in previous board meetings, Supervisor Sark Chavez um, stated about the concerns about code enforcement and that she does receive numerous complaints. I would like to see if that if you could consider the following have the MECO applicants pay for fees or establish a payback program code enforcement and the department. Um, department of health are adequately funded and staffed to resolve current code violations prior to adding more programs that the departments provide monthly information to Board of Supervisors of pending concerns and a completion time frame so that these two departments have a clear plan of action and residents will have timely resolutions to complaints. Thank you very much. Thank you, and our final speaker is Connie Robo-Ludwig. Thank you. Um, I, I, will, I won't want to repeat uh, some of the things that um, 
Ms. Luna already addressed, but um, given the fact that, um, as she indicated, Supervisor Chavez had addressed some of the issues um, concerning uh, our community. And um, although this is a wonderful program, um, we already have so many challenges regarding noise, ordinances, excessive parking, traffic, loud music um, that is very disruptive. Um, I am in San Martin and on Friday nights during the summer, I hear the music from Morgan Hill um, uh, events. And my point with that is, although it's nice, um, the noise just really travels in this valley. And so I'm concerned about how these uh, issues will be uh, addressed. And I hope that um, you will um, consider and address them before um, voting to approve this. Um, and I thank you for your time. And this concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second on the table. Let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Sumidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, item nine we addressed on consent. Item 10 is a public hearing, fiscal 21-22 Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Act. And as a reminder, we're gonna go from this item to item 26, which is the Heading Home Campaign Report. Good morning, Board Good morning. President Ellenberg, members of the board, Consuelo Hernandez, Director, Office of Supportive Housing, and I'm joined this morning by Hillary Armstrong, our Program Manager 3, who's responsible for housing initiatives. Item number nine um, is a public hearing related to our Community Development Block Grant and Home Just Investment. for clarity, it's number 10, item Apologies, 10. Apologies, number 10. You're correct, number 10. Um, this is an amended um, amendment to our prior year fiscal year program that's required by HUD in order for us to access one-time home ARP funding. Um, it is connected and tied to our Heading Home campaign. The majority of the funding will be made available to support families that are enrolled in the Heading Home campaign. Um, we brought this item originally to the board last year, um, but need an additional time to wrap up the plan and submit it to HUD before the end of the month for approval. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Before we do questions, I will open the hearing for, open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? We have none. Then I shall close the public hearing. And now turn to um, colleague Supervisor Lee. Yes, ready to go move per staff recommendation. Second. Motion and a second. No further comments. Uh, let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidium? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Looking right back to our Office of Supportive Housing for the report on Heading Home Campaign, which is item number 26. Thank you again, Board President. Item number 26 is our quarterly report showing our progress um, in implementation of the Heading Home Campaign. I'm going to hand it over to Hillary, who will deliver the presentation. Thank you, Consuelo. Good morning, President Ellenberg and members of the board. I'm Hillary Armstrong, a program manager with the Office of Supportive Housing. And today we wanted to share some highlights from the Heading Home campaign since our last report in November of 2022. As a reminder, Heading Home is a campaign to achieve functional zero for family homelessness by the end of 2025. And for those who aren't aware, functional zero is how we refer to reaching the state where the number of housing placements available for families is greater than the number of families who are entering homelessness. And we have four primary strategies for the Heading Home campaign, um, and they are leveraging emergency housing vouchers, which we'll talk a little bit more about, expanding our rapid rehousing programs through the county, expanding our prevention strategies, and creating new permanent and affordable housing. 
So just a few highlights from the past quarter. Um, now, since the start of the Heading Home campaign in October of 2022, we have 635 families with children who have obtained permanent housing and 474 more who were in housing search as of the end of calendar year 2022. I'm also happy to report that as of February 15th, 2023, that number is even higher. We have 729 families housed and 618 who are in housing search. With regard to emergency housing vouchers, um, we have 1,075 uh, 1, applications for EHVs that were submitted to the Santa Clara County Housing Authority. Um, and this ensures that our county will be able to um, fulfill all of the housing vouchers that came to our county through that program. Of those vouchers, uh, 407 were housed as of January 31st, and another 500 were in housing search, plus some whose applications were pending, so progress continues there. We've also worked to strengthen our partnerships with First Five and the NICU and worked on implementing the State Family Homelessness Challenge Grant, um, where we will be expanding our population serve to include pregnant, uh, pregnant uh, families, um, families with infants, and families with children ages zero to five. Uh, we also have the first site-based rapid rehousing program opened for families in the fall of 2022 at the Vela Apartments in San Jose. The opening slide of this presentation is a photo of the, that apartment building. And we continue to work on increasing capacity for homelessness prevention through the Emergency Assistance Network and Homelessness Prevention System. And last but absolutely not least, uh, working on really expanding the um, pipeline of affordable and supportive housing for families. And so we wanted to share that uh, by the end of 2025, we'll have 848 new units of supportive and affordable housing open for families. Attachment A to the report um, gives you more of a breakdown by the project, which will show you more about the location and the number of units for families. Oh, and somehow that screen is blank. So let me just see what I can do there for you. One moment, apologies. Okay, let's try that again. It's always good when the data shows up blank. Okay, so I can't do that in full screen, so we'll do that in not full screen. <laughs> we do have data. <laughs> we also wanted to share our dashboard with you, which has been updated with a few additional data points as we work as a team to kind of dive deeper into the data to better understand the needs for our families who are unhoused. Um, and so some of the points that we have added to the dashboard include the breakdown of the ages of um, the children um, who've been housed. Um, and so you can see here that um, uh, almost half of the um, families uh, with children include children five and under. Um, we also included some data on the next slide that shows uh, where families sleep. Okay, um, one sec. Let me see if escaping will. Apologies, again, we do have data, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing and try, try again one moment. Um, and so what I can do is just walk you through the dashboard and then um, it's attached to your packet. Um, we did want to share uh, that we have additional information on um, the second slide of our dashboard that shows where families sleep. Thank you, Consuelo. Um, and we wanted to share that it looks like a number of our families are actually um, spending um, their nights in cars, uh, around 30%, um, followed by followed by shelters, um, other situations, couch surfing, and then um, a lower number, thankfully, are outdoors, but still um, more than we would like. Um, the uh, third slide of our dashboard shows the current enrollment of families with children throughout our system, just to give you a picture um, of where families are seeking and receiving services. And then finally, um, we show where the 478 families who were housed, their demographic breakdown. And so with that, we just wanted to highlight our next steps for the campaign, which includes um, implementation of the Family Homelessness Challenge Grant with the state. And like I said, that grant was originally primarily to focus on um, pregnant families and families with infants. That will still be the primary um, focus, but we also have been working with the state to expand eligibility to also include families with children under five. Um, and we'll be looking a lot at the homelessness prevention because we see a lot of need there. We'll 
We'll also continue to work on strengthening landlord engagement and working with the Santa Clara County Housing Authority who are working on plans to really revamp that area and, and, and strengthen that. So we'll be working with them intensively over this next quarter, we hope. Um, expanding our prevention system, and you had uh, have some items um, on your agenda today regarding that and continuing to build partnerships. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Consuelo, very much for, for the report as well as the rest of, of your staffs and the um, folks from SSA and BHHP and our external partners, uh, and to Supervisor Chavez as well for partnering on the original referral in April of 2021 for the Heading Home campaign. Uh, I will hold my comments, and Supervisor Chavez, why don't you begin? Thank you, and, um, and Supervisor Ellenberg, thank you for always focusing on families and appreciate your leadership uh, in this area and so many others. Um, a, a couple things that I, I wanted to just ask that we could better understand, and one of them, and I'm gonna use your last slide on next steps, you did such a nice job of laying that out. Could you talk just a little bit about how we strengthen the partnership between our healthcare facilities and getting people services. And I mention this because um, we've had two clients who um, were homeless in our hospitals who gave birth that we weren't able to connect to services. Um, and, and both um, patients gave us feedback that they had alerted our staff at the healthcare institution that they were in fact homeless. And so I'm just wondering a little bit about um, training and ex what should our expectations be in terms of how our own healthcare facilities are responding to these families? Thank you for that question, Supervisor Chavez, and, and for those families, um, I know that we're, we will look into kind of debriefing the situation for them in particular. I will say, I think training and in building connections. Um, so with the NICU in particular, we've had meetings with some of the core staff to just make sure they know kind of what, what how our system works and how to access that system for families who are in their program and in the bridge program for um, folks kind of post-discharge from the NICU. And we're gonna come to an upcoming staff meeting and present again kind of about our system and accessing our system and then i think the other um the other core is kind of how to how to connect with osh um, when things aren't going as planned in the system and kind of who those core um key connections are you know i think um there there are um there are some challenges in terms of just a great a great number of folks who need need shelter right now and so i know that that's one of our other areas of focus um, but i think in terms of training we're also working with first five to meet overall with labor and delivery so to kind of expand beyond the nicu understanding that there are a number of families who probably aren't nicu involved but would need similar services so what would be um beneficial i think for us to understand is in a more detailed way, what is our expectation for somebody who is giving birth who is um, homeless? And you know, NICU and, and non-NICU, I think your point is well taken. Um, but I, I don't really think, I mean, I don't understand it, and I, I just did a tour of our, our healthcare facility, and it was clear to me that there was not a shared understanding of our, our program. And I think, Hillary, your really smart point, and I just wanna say I think it's really important is recognizing that when it doesn't work, who are the, who are the principals that need to talk to each other is really smart. I, I, the other issue, though, I just wanna make sure I understand is that um, if we have contact with a, a, a parent who's homeless with a newborn, Outside of a voucher, um, what, if any, action are we taking on the interim? Does that mean a, a, a voucher? Does it mean a hotel voucher? And if, if that's the case, well, anyway, let me just let you answer that. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Chavez. We are advising families that, have, that are pregnant, who are homeless, or have an infant to call the Here For You hotline because if they try to reach out to us, they're really, every minute that they spend trying to get in touch with me, for instance, is time 
not spent well. If they call the hotline, they're here for you. Um, the people that are answering the phones know to screen for unhoused pregnant women um, or those that have an infant. And then what happens? If then they, they will because eat. actually we've had problems with both I mean, one that I talked to you directly about, but one that did call the hotline and did not get a response, and they then one that talk, called the hotline, got a response, and then was in a really a place that was less clean than their car. They will be prioritized for, um, if there is no capacity in our shelter, then they will be placed in a motel until a shelter bed becomes available. And I can tell you of several instances back in November where we have a cold weather shelter that we're operating in Mountain View where we offered an individual who was pregnant the opportunity to move there while we figured something out for them and they declined the placement. Um, so that is something that we're also struggling with. That it doesn't happen often, but it does happen where the option we've presented isn't um, somewhere that they want to go, and it does delay the placement. So right now our advice is call the Here For You hotline. They flag it. They flag it for our staff, um, and then we will do what we need to in order to accommodate the, the priority population that we're serving around families. And Consuelo, on the shelter, that it's not a family shelter per se, it's a, a regular shelter? It's both supervisors. So we have the hotel program through Amigos de Guadalupe, we have Casitas, we have a shelter in North County, um, Hamlin Court, a portion of those units are for families and it's just for urgent needs. We've put folks there while we figure out either a hotel room or a family shelter. Um, we do partner with the city of San Jose. They have Evans Lane as an interim housing site. And we have a few other spots where we put people. Um, and that's why we want to drive everybody to the hotline. It helps us also gauge the need in the community. If they don't go through the hotline, it makes it harder for us to project out you know, where we need to grow, um, specifically around shelter. Thank, uh, thank you, through the chair and with the forbearance of my colleague, Supervisor Chavez. Um, and she will know what I mean when I say no blurting out today. <laughs> um, Ms. Hernandez, the reference you made to the person who was referred in Mountain View, were they staying at um, the Hope and Mercy shelter, the cold weather shelter? That is the option that was declined, Supervisor Simidian. That, thank you. I just I wanted to clarify that other piece. Thank you. I think um, what would be helpful for us it, or for me is that if our offices had the person we are to call when it doesn't work, because Consuelo, I know you're on my phone list, um, and and frankly, uh, I think your point about uh, you know having people go through the pipeline and understanding the need, I, I think that is absolutely critical, and I really do appreciate the the sensibleness of that. Um, and at the same time, when we get a call from someone who's got an infant that's homeless, we all wanna respond to it. So, um, and I think we've shared just the concerns. You know, one of the co colleagues, one other point I'll just raise is that it does really speak to one of the challenges of not having an expanded family shelter and a place that people feel safe, because I do think that sometimes at least my conversations with folks is that they're declining places that they do not feel safe in and 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 why people feel safe in certain environments i don't know but i consuelo and colleagues will remember that or consuelo will remember this that we had a family that was living along the guadalupe river and um a number of people had gone out to talk to them and one the family didn't want to be separated was two parents and i think three children um and they felt safer, uh, it, it, so there were two problems. The, the family being separated, they didn't want to be separated, which we all understand that. And then the safety, they actually felt safer on the creek than they did in our, in our um, care. And so I just, I, I lift that up more because I think it's something we just need to recognize as a problem, particularly with this population that we're trying to serve. Um, so thank you for that. On the expanded, um, uh, prevention system. Could you just take a minute about your vision for that longer term as we get to functional zero? Thank you, Supervisor. 
Yes, I think one of the things that we've really learned in the first year and a quarter of the campaign is the number of families seeking our help who are unstably housed. And so who have, who are still have a roof over their heads, but there's something about that, either their rent burden or the situation that they're in that is um, making them at risk of homelessness. And so one of the one of the main focuses for expanding our, our prevention is to, is to make sure that we're really meeting that need because we were realizing that our, our homeless inflow data actually included some folks who are actually still housed. And so I think it's it's twofold. I think it's well, it's multifold, but I think there's two main focuses. One is really around um, making sure that folks have flexible and robust rental assistance and other emergency financial assistance to keep them housed um, and to keep them in a situation you know, where it's stable, where it's stable um, for their children. Um, so that's the first piece of it. And as you all know, our homelessness prevention system has expanded greatly since the pilot started in 2017. Um, and there's some really great aspects of that where um, some smaller, more grassroots providers have joined that network and are really able to provide um, more focused assistance to the families that they serve. So I think that's one piece of it, is ensuring kind of a broad reach um, and the kind of robust financial assistance. And another piece is, is expanding our housing problem solving, which is a program that's available through the for you hotline um, and it's really to work creatively with folks to address the situation that they're in and if there's something short of like traditional rental assistance that can help keep them housed um, sometimes often with family members um, in providing some support to make that situation work for the entire family so as we look at the um, challenge grant uh, we're looking at including that and Supervisor, if I can just add, the community plan to end homelessness calls for an expansion of the program that would allow us to serve 2,500 households a year. Um, and one of the kind of visions that we look at is really integrating into the safety net. So earlier this year or late last year, the board approved an agreement in partnership with Office of Supportive Housing, the Behavioral Health Department, um, and abode services to look at families who are experiencing their first episode of psychosis and how do we prevent them from becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one body of work. Um, we also are expanding our relationship and partnership with SSA and CalWORKS. So I think looking at the prevention system beyond what it's been today, um, which is its own system, but looking at the subcategories of people. I mean, we've even talked to um, social services agency with older adults and how, do, you know, they're very vulnerable. They can't afford an apartment on their own. So what does prevention look like for that population? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's going to take a lot of work and coordination with so many different people and departments. So how do we keep the core of HPS that we've built, but then allow the flexibility to serve these very specific targeted populations and, mm -hmm. and families in a lot of cases who are having to deal with multi-generational, like the family that you uh, mentioned, Supervisor Chavez, from last year. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of that that we're also doing. I think that's, you know, I, I know my colleagues are going to be excited to jump in on this as well. And I, I think um, it kind of leads me to the, the last big point I wanted to raise, which is that I really appreciate the complexity of the environment that you're dealing with and recognize that our own, like our system, our county system, is pretty deep in the community. And a lot of times we're saying, oh, we're going to reach out to an EAN and we're funding them, which we should, to be able to provide rental assistance. But the fact of the matter is that between SSA and the hospitals, our 14 clinics, that the, 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 um, we, we actually have a lot of tentacles, but we're not, a, we're not conveying to our core. I don't know what that sound is. <laughs> Sounds like a little creaky boat. <laughs> so maybe that's the rain. But, um, but, I, but I just would really like to encourage um, through the county exec a, a kind of a deeper discussion about how our programs are actually reaching people ourselves instead of us adding a whole new body of work to do outreach on a particular issue. It, it really doesn't make sense and we can't keep growing in that way and this really is more about prevention and it's one of the reasons I was so excited about the Children's Advocacy Office because I really thought that was our way to lean in on prevention. Um, but so anyway, what, what I just wanted to um, also share is on the agenda today, colleagues, we have, I don't know, maybe 12 different items related to housing. Um, and 
we have a very difficult time, I think, uh, telling the story about what we are getting done and how we were get, getting that work done and what the implications and impacts are of the county in partnership with all of our other cities. Um, so I'm gonna highlight for my colleagues that I'm gonna be bringing a referral that is just about communications relative to the work we're doing um, regarding housing and homelessness because I think in the absence of that, um, we, our inability to really explain this to commu the community is gonna impact us in a lot of ways, but one of them, and, and I've heard Susan, I've heard you say this, and I think it's so powerful. We were speaking at an event, and randomly Susan said, and by the way, if you're a landlord and you own property and you wanna be part of heading home, see me. And that's great, um, but it really should be you know, all hands on deck, a much different kind of communication strategy with our community and, you know, and not just relying on our incredible president, spokesperson, uh, but really having a more robust um, outreach. So I wanted to lift that up and say, well done. There's a lot of work in this agenda we didn't even talk about and that you're paddling very fast underwater and appreciate it. And also really appreciate just the dramatic um, move that you've made to end family homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. I'm going to um, weigh in here because your your comments are are virtually identical to what I wanted to point out around uh, communication. And I know that um, Consuelo has has heard me say this before. And first of all, the amount of work and the number of people that have been housed is tremendous. So part of the communication may be to expand access, but a lot of it is truly just to to tell this story. And I w was noting the, the number currently of 618 families currently searching and quickly followed by the statement that 848 new units are in process, which made me think, are we starting to give up on, or do we think that we're saturated with what current landlords will do such that we have to build all of our own units? And and then to, to echo Supervisor Chavez, I. I do talk about this everywhere, but that's not a system. <laughs> and, and thinking about really investing money and time in, um, in something very strategic and, and intentional media stories, you know, publicly highlighting the campaign, sharing videos of, you know, you don't need me to give, I'm not a marketing person, I'm just having a platform, so I'm spewing ideas. But I do think that a concentrated investment in communication and and outreach in the right language to the right audience. If it's landlords, what else do we need to tell them to get them to do this? Um, because there's no limit to what you all can do with, when everybody is on board. So thank you very much and thank you Supervisor Chavez for teeing that up. Supervisor Smidian. I wanna use my time for a slightly different purpose. <sighs> Um, I've been back on this board for 10 years. I have been a part of the work. I have observed your work. Um, I have had occasion to watch you all, and I mean not just the two folks who are here before us, but your uh, colleagues get uh, at least rhetorically beaten about the head and shoulders out in the community, uh, either for what it is you are hoping to do or perhaps for what it is you have not yet been able to do. I frankly cannot imagine uh, how so many folks keep going day after day after day in the face of such great need. And the sense that I think sometimes must be overwhelming that we're never gonna get it all done. And so what I wanted to use my time for today was to say thank you for what you have been able to get done. I think it is hard when there is always more work in front of us to take a moment and take some sense of satisfaction for the lives that have been changed for the better in ways we can sometimes only imagine, not always see. Um, I hope that gives you some comfort, some sense of solace. I hope that the work yet to be done doesn't overwhelm the sense of satisfaction I think you and your colleagues should have for the work you have been able to do. Uh, it is 
extraordinary work. It is transformative work. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of better to light one candle than to curse the darkness, and you have lit literally tens of thousands of candles. So uh, good for you, and thank you very much. That's what I have today, Madam President. Beautifully said, and I will second and third it. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Mm. Uh, thank you, President Rosenberg, uh, Ellenberg. Um, I would like to also uh, echo a lot of the comments of my colleagues, and I want to first of all thank our Director of Office of Support Housing, Consuelo Hernandez, uh, along with your team, Hillary, and the OSH team for your hard work on these quality reports concerning the Heading Home campaign. Our county staff and partners are working hard to alleviate the housing crisis for our families and children, but I also want to recognize the gaps that we're also seeing. Um, right at the Sunnyvale shelter, I have learned that they've expanded services year-round now, but there were also a few school-aged children and families in the shelter being increased recently, and now they're way more than we ever expected that to be in the congregate shelter. Certainly, the eviction moratorium that expired last year hasn't helped the matters and exacerbated the increase of families being evicted and being placed in congregate shelters here. As Supervisor Chavez just noted, uh, Congress shelter settings could be a very traumatizing environment for anyone, and especially our children. And when we mix singles and families together, it just really don't work. We de desperately need to fix these gaps. Um, so for as a short-term measure, I would like to request that the administration work with our housing partners, such as Home First, to partition, to partition a portion of the shelter to dedicate to families and children so that they could be provided with additional privacy and children and family services. But as a long-term measure, I'm really hoping that we can eventually provide those in the congregate shelters with small individual units that provide more private and humane living conditions. This will certainly encourage our in-house neighbors to participate instead of sleeping in the tents and at the dangerous creeks and streets, especially in this inclement weather that we are dealing with right now. And one last thing I want to mention is that I really think we need to tell a better story. We need to have our residents that have received our services successfully to tell their own important story from being unhoused to having a home through these programs and these beautiful slides. In language, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Hindi, there are so many languages we could use to, to tell their story of how it actually works in our county and how their lives has been changed. And I think it is so important to change that dialogue instead of having the stuff that we hear in the press so often when people mixing issues together, uh, adding unhoused of homeless and crimes and, and, and trash and, and, and instead of really working together to make this from a NIMBY issue to an issue that we are really serving everybody. So I just want to make that point clear, and, and thank you very much for your great, great work on, on this every day. Thank you. Thank you to all of my colleagues. I'm very proud to be part of this board. Uh, do we have public comments on this item? No public comments at this time. Oh, we do have one. Just raise their hand. OK, let's give it a second in case anybody else does. Please, if you're on Zoom and would like to speak on item 26, now is the time to raise your hand. And Consuelo and Hillary, thank you again for just phenomenal work. All right, and our speaker is Sharon Luna. Sharon, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Good morning, President Ellenberg and, and supervisors. I just really enjoyed this presentation. I thought that it was very thorough and it gave a lot of insight as far as what is going on with um, the families and uh, providing housing for them. I am a landlord and I wanted to thank Supervisor Chavez 
uh, for stating that there needs to be more communication um, with landlords and, you know, establishing probably, you know, the possibility of getting landlords together and talking about what they're facing. In my case, I am a small business that I have to pay every year a small business for a small business license in order to have my rental home. Um, we've had increases in regard to services on our property tax bill, on garbage, water, everything. And we are trying to for my renter in lower um, because of their situation. And I think if the cities and the counties understand what small landlords are going through and trying to keep the cost down and, and communicate what possibly could be done to waive some of the fees that we're having to pay because it always seems that there's additional monies that um, are in, you know, imposed on the small landlord. Um, I would appreciate, you know, some communication with landlords getting together and, and discussing some of these um, efforts to help continue with the services. Thank you. That's just a delight. Do we have other public speakers on this item? Not at this time. We are aware of the static issues, and we do have tech looking I'm into sure. it. I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take a vote on this. Do we need a vote? This was received report. We do. Yes, because we have direction. Move approval. Chavez. Second. Did we have a second? Second from Supervisor Lee. All right. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. You have a quorum. Thank you. <laughs> we... It, it passed. It passed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some technical issues yeah, on my side, <laughs> too, so... We are all good. <laughs> Item 12 is a referral regarding supplying and maintaining Narcan in county libraries. And I'm looking to Supervisor Lee. We do Thank item 11. Apologies for the interruption, uh, Board President Ellenberg. Were we going to take action 11? 11 also, yes. We certainly are. Thank you very much. Item 11 is a public hearing, uh, FY 2022-2023 Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Act. Thank you for catching that. Thank you. Apologies. The name, the naming convention of the legislative files is very similar. This action is related to our current fiscal year program. The board adopted the current plan last May. Um, after the action taken by the board, the federal government released the final allocations for our program. So this action is needed to recognize that difference. Um, our community development block grant entitlement amount was lower than we anticipated, and our home allocation was higher than anticipated. It's very hard most recently to project our allocation when we don't get that number from HUD. Any delays with the federal budget um, causes a delay in our ability to uh, provide the most accurate number. Also in this fiscal year, we are recognizing one-time revenues um, that are required to be presented to the public and to the board as a substantial amendment. Anything that's higher than a certain percentage requires that we hold the public hearing, let the public know how we intend to use the funding. Unfortunately, we're also up against a, a statutory deadline which requires us that requires us to spend a certain amount of funding every year um, by the end of April, no later than May 5th. Um, today's action would allow us to recognize one-time revenue in a little over $3 million, which we're proposing to put towards the acquisition of Hillview Court. Um, you previously approved this action last year. We would basically be reducing our um, Measure A 2016 obligation uh, by $3 million, which would allow us to use that $3 million in Measure A for other projects. 
Um, happy to take any questions. It's a pretty straightforward action, but it does require a public hearing um, and us notifying the public that we're making this recommendation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. If we can get a motion and a second, I'll then open the public hearing. I'll make a motion. Second. Thank you. Opening the public hearing. Uh, Rhonda, do we have any speakers on in the chamber or on Zoom? I do not. Then I shall close the public hearing and turn to colleagues for any comments before a vote. No? All right. That's what I know, Rhonda, you're trying to do a thousand things, but we're ready to vote. Testing. All right. So I'm sorry, I missed your request because we're, we're ready for a vote on this. All right, item. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sumedian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And now we are up to item 12, which is a referral from Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Ellenberg. Uh, item number 12 is a proposal to basically provide Narcan or na nano and then Naloxone into our library uh, all over the county and including training our staff and volunteers uh, and looking at source of funding to make this work. As we have talked before, opioid overdose deaths have been increasing at a ridiculously alarming rate in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, I have personally been impacted by this crisis having lost a cousin from overdose a couple of years ago. We must act and do everything we can to pre prevent these senseless deaths, which is the reason of my referral today. Narcan saves lives, period. It is safe, it is easy to use, and needs to be accessible to as many people as possible. Last year, we have approved on this board to provide this at various high schools. We're now working to look into potentially even middle schools because this stuff is now, get the fentanyl is getting to younger kids as well. Uh, and we have also approved to put this in our uh, incarcerated uh, facilities in our jails to, for the visiting areas, in vending machines, for example. So now we're now looking at another location, which is libraries. Library is a place where people access resources and support. Libraries are safe spaces, and our tireless staff are trusted, compassionate, and knowledgeable. So therefore, having Narcans in libraries is really a no-brainer. Several California counties, including Los Angeles and Kern, have already taken this step, and there's currently also state legislation pushing for this idea as well. In the Kern County, this initiative was taken because so many overdoses were happening actually right there in the libraries, on the bathrooms. As a community safety net, I believe it is time to explore these options as well because the cost of inaction is too high. Having Narcan libraries is simple and an effective way to save lives and support our communities. I really do hope that I could count my board, colleagues, and administration to support this effort to explore these options for our county as soon as possible. Thank you. I'll, I'll second it and then I just have a request. Go right ahead. Thank you, um, and thank you, Supervisor Lee, both for sharing um, your loss, and I'm, I'm sorry uh, to you and your family for that. And second, I'm very excited about this expansion. Um, when the staff comes back, one request I would make is that we understand the current um, uh, resources that have, have been spent on Narcan from the county's general fund versus that which will come free to us. And the second is to understand when we're, what type of um, um, naloxone is being used, meaning is it the kind that you have to, uh, you know, like something you have to put together or is it just something you can use easily? And that's easily. important because there is one that requires you to ha have a little bit of, um, you know, to put, put it together versus just being able to access it and use it. So if those two things could be included, and partly the reason I'm asking uh, Supervisor Lee is that um, as part of the Fentanyl Working Group, we've been rolling out different um, strategies in different locations, and it's been a little unclear to me what our source of funds for each of those actions have been, and then what does that mean long term for our ability to sustain it? Absolutely, I certainly support that. And, and, and I was um, working around one of the ways, which is nasal spray, for example. Those instructions is actually very uh, 
ear, clear and easy to use. And I just want to say that um, uh, even though it's easy to use, I certainly think that we should still provide some uh, training to folks to make sure that uh, there's something that, that the library staff volunteers, they'll be familiar with it. And this is the type of training I think we could expand countywide in so many areas as well. And I do believe our staff is providing training now and in partnership with the County Office of Education. So we, we're already doing that. But I think the point that you raised um, for the library staff is really an important one. The issue that I was raising about the the um, different types is is uh, also I hadn't thought about this, but I'm glad you raised training because it is that is actually a training issue, you know. And then the other thing I'll say that I didn't know, except that I've gone to a couple of the trainings, and I know Supervisor Smitty and you've hosted one as well, that um, that's that sometimes when you use the the um, Narcan or naloxone that the response can be very quick, but depending on how much drugs the person's ingested, that you actually have to use it a second time mm -hmm. or sometimes a third time. So you're right um, that training both on how to use the particular product and then um, you know what the implications are as you see the person responding or not is just good, thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Let me just ask uh, County Council and uh, our CEO, Dr. Smith, are there meet and confer issues here? <clears throat> there, there may be with respect to training and support for county staff, yes. Well, and I, even beyond the training and support, I, um, if there's an expectation that folks will administer in case of emergency, is that a, a new duty that is subject to meet and confer as well? Uh, maybe I can jump in here. <clears throat> There's no um, policy and procedure set at this point, so um, I think the request, the referral is merely to come up with a funding scheme to develop the ability to use naloxone. Um, there currently, since there's currently no policy and procedure, there would be a time period to develop that and run it by the unions. And obviously there would be some people who would not be interested in participating, but that would have to be covered with the policy and procedure. So I think we're away ways before we need to make those decisions. Thank you. Through the chair, I, I will just um, uh, encourage uh, our team to sort of anticipate uh, those issues so that we don't uh, suddenly confront a challenge that we could have could have and arguably should have anticipated. It, it has been my experience um, over the years that understandably folks who do not typically think of themselves as providing health care services can be concerned and reticent or even resistant to providing those services um, and I, I just think we ought to anticipate that possibility and uh, think through how that case gets made if, if we go down this path okay thank you thank you additional comments from Supervisor Lee or Supervisor Chavez? I would just add that um, it would be important to take a look at policies we already have, like we put AEDs throughout the facilities and you know what expectation, if any, we have for staff being able to use those versus Narcan. I think that's a, a really important thing that, I mean, an important path we may already have. And then the other is that um, just to just to follow up on what Supervisor Smidian read, uh, raised is that the County Office of Education has been doing trainings with multiple school districts, and so they may have answered some of these questions already that would be of value to know how they did that. Um, and lastly, I, I believe there's only one major school district in the county that hasn't yet um, adopted the um, approach that we're taking to fentanyl prevention in that San Jose Unified School District. And so one, um, it, it's not related to this uh, per se, so I'm not sure I'm asking council this question, and I would ask my colleagues this question as well. Um, can, as part of this action, I ask for a formal letter of inquiry from our, um, from the county, just asking San Jose Unified School District 
what support, if any, they would need to do the kind of training and education that we're already doing in support of other schools. I think that'd be fine to add to the item. Then I will make that as a, a motion and ask for a formal letter of inquiry to San Jose Unified School District, offering them whatever support and help they need to make sure that their parents, teachers, and students know how to use um, Narcan and understand the risks of opioids, including fentanyl. Supervisor Chavez, I'm not sure. I think th this is Supervisor Lee's referral. He may have started with a motion. So do you want a separate motion I'm on that? Or do you to want incorporate into the motion. Yes, yeah. Amendment to the motion. Yes. Yeah, thank just you. just want to keep uh -huh. us clear. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else? No, no. I think we're good. Do we have thank any you. public speakers on this item? All right, let's take vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Allenberg? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I will announce that um, we will break for lunch from 12.30 to 1, uh, which should get us at least through item 16 and perhaps even a little bit further. Uh, so item 13 is a um, referral regarding loans of physical county, county physical assets to community-based organizations. And again, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wassenberg. Um, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> President Ellenberg, I'm telling you. <laughs> this is funny how, uh, how we get that working. Sorry about that. I need my coffee. Thank you. Lunch. Yes, the lunch is coming. Yes, thank you. Well, as many of you are aware, uh, the District 3 office has had a very strong tradition uh, of assisting many of our community-based organizations with their hosting the events. My predecessor, uh, currently Senator Dave Cortese, has raised uh, funds to establish a community sponsorship fund to acquire some of the m most commonly used equipment to hold community events to help support our uh, the county departments and the CBOs with their events as a service to our, uh, res our residents uh, throughout the county. Um, the type of items we're talking about is like the stage, uh, a audiovisual AV systems, uh, some type of a um, uh, speakers uh, and some of the canopies. Um, our District 3 staff has certainly worked very closely with our uh, FAF and other departments uh, like the Retro Voters, ROV, to manage the request to supply other items like tables and chairs to the CBOs and other county departments. Now that the community events are also going back in person after this pandemic, uh, county assets like stages, tables, chairs, canopies are back in high demand and as these uh, uh, various uh, equipment rentals have also becoming increasingly cost prohibitive for many of the CBOs. Uh, being able to borrow stage, canopy, save equipment, tables and chairs from the county can certainly save those CBOs you know, lots and lots of uh, funds and allowing them to use the, the, the fund to focus on their programming and sharing the community with a broader audience. And frankly, having these equipment sitting in some storage space over the weekends really is a waste. These loans of county assets have allowed our offices and our other, off, other offices, uh, certainly uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, and other offices that have, have used these to build stronger relationships with many, many community groups and help increase the awareness of the work of our county and our services. Now, since we have now back to uh, being in person, uh, I know that uh, certainly our office and supervisor service office have been uh, inundated with many, many requests to, to borrow these equipment. So upon learning that the loans of county assets are governed by board policy uh, and also our county charter and subject to board and county executive approval, uh, I have put in a moratorium uh, for, on these requests to borrow equipment from our office for events that was not sponsored out of concerns of our potential liability. Um, and, and frankly, by having this this type of a stop, uh, various relationships that we've been able to help CBOs have been hurt. Uh, and, and this has been ongoing for over a year. I put this referral forward to help streamline a simple process for the board offices to provide these temporary loans of our county assets to help our, our neighbors and help our community. And I'm hoping the administration can come back with a seamless way to track the most commonly requested com county assets for events outline a process for CBOs to borrow these assets and provide a clear requirements that CBOs must adhere to to borrow these equipment from us. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other lights, do we have any public speakers on this item? Let's take a vote, please. We have a motion nope. and a second. Um, Dr. Smith has the light on. After oh. I call Dr. Smith. 
Now we'll take a vote. <laughs> May I just um, add one thing? Uh, so I'm excited about this. I think it's the right thing to do. And one other thing I would like the county to consider, the staff to consider, is that um, FAF does a phenomenal job when they're engaged. And I just wanted to say a, a thank you to them because we've sort of stalked them. Um, and one thing that I would just like to highlight is that we do have a county policy relative to county sponsorship of events. It's not necessarily even one of our offices. And I would like the sponsorship um, policy to be considered here as well. Because, And it's not a sponsor. It's not the, the checks we write, but it's like when we invest in an event, how we use our logos and all that. And my only point here is that I think Otto is absolutely right that um, this is such a great service to our nonprofit partners and our little neighborhood associations or big ones. It's just, it's just something that I, I want us to make sure that we don't get ourselves tangled up in our own, getting out of our own way to make it possible for us to help in such a thought. I mean, it's it really people appreciate it in a way that almost nothing else we do gets us mm -hmm. the same sort of feedback. So, and I, I do want to say thank you to the staff who's been working on it. And before we vote, I just want to compare uh, the number. Just want to mention uh, specifically on our staff, uh, one of the staff members, Dave Nguyen, has just been above and beyond in this effort. I want to really mention that. And the fact that he was able to partner with other areas from reentry and, and some of the folks who was in the day worker program that's able to help out to get these stages set up, to break it down after the events, uh, absolutely has been, been vital to so many uh, community groups. And they are very appreciative of the efforts that come back to me and keep telling me how great a job he's doing. I just want to make this a public acknowledgement of what great work that he's been able to provide to our, not just our district, but the entire county community in so many ways. I just want to mention that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take a vote on this item. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Item 14 is being held. Item 15 is the county executive's report. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Just wanted to give an update on what we're doing with regard to developing the recommended budget. Uh, we've uh, worked with all the departments, uh, developed looking at and clarifying their requests. We've let all of them know that at this point we're looking at a deficit position which may change within the next few weeks depending on the uh, updates of the FSRs, financial reviews from the departments. Um, and the deficit at this point is falling in the 100 to 120 million dollar range. Um, we um, have looked at all of the proposals from the departments. Needless to say, there's not going to be m many recommendations for new projects that impact the general fund. However, um, in new projects that impact restricted funds may um, be put forward to the board for consideration. Um, as always, um, we're looking at the priorities that the board has set politically, our legal requirements, and our operational requirements in order to develop a recommended budget. Um, and it will be <clears throat> out on May 1st. Um, any questions? Any questions? Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, this is actually related to most recently, I guess, just happened even starting Thursday. Uh, as we have all heard in the news about how Silicon Valley Bank has just gone through this uh, uh, receivership by the FDIC uh, and, and a lot of concerns about our banking health in the Silicon Valley and, and Santa Clara County. First of all, I just want to confirm that uh, there is no impact that we are aware of directly to this county in terms of our deposits uh, with some of these banks, correct? I can't say that um, definitively at this point. We're looking at all of our uh, funds and fund balances and debt um, and income requirements. Um, you know, we have literally thousands of programs, so we're looking through it in detail to make sure uh, 
we don't have any impact or to define what impact there might be, direct impact that is. In terms of um, indirect impact, we, um, just like everyone else, don't have an absolutely clear idea of what the indirect impact will be, but it'll be significant since <clears throat> it is, <clears throat> excuse me, a bank that's specialized in um, high-tech um, um, financing in this county, and we expect that'll have some impact on number of high-tech departments or businesses in our county, which presumably would have impact upon their employees and, you know, um, layoffs. I know that essentially everyone from the bank has been laid off. Um, there will be other layoffs, I'm sure, associated with um, lack of funding from businesses. Um, and then there also are individuals, small businesses, that have utilized um, SVB, and that will certainly have some impact too. So um, the basic answer is we're looking into it, and there's still a lot of unknowns. It's unclear exactly what the feds will be doing, although they've made it somewhat clear that they're going to try to reimburse uh, customers, but that's a general statement in the nitty gritty of details is what is important. Reimburse when, how much, what proportion of their loss, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and certainly the devils is in the details, as they say. Uh, so uh, since I know we, we're not meeting for another few, three weeks in April, I would like to see uh, Dr. Smith, if it's possible, if you can give some type of agenda update as you learn about these issues, how that would impact us. But, um, sure, that's our intention. things are moving so quickly right now on these issues. Right, that's our intention. We didn't want to um, get in front of ourselves, so once we're confident of the information we have, we'll get it to the board off agenda. And, 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 and relate to that, so if there's any urgent action that needs to be taken on this by this board, and we have to, because of how things are ch changing so quickly in the financial markets and whatnot, that could affect our bottom line, uh, I would say please let us know ASAP. Thank you. Yes, we'll definitely let you know. Um, well, forget it. Yes. Supervisor we'll, Smithian. We'll let you know. is going to make a smart aleck remark, but, <laughs> you know, related to public banks which we've talked about in the future, not a good idea right now. On a totally different topic, uh, let me just say thank you again, uh, Dr. Smith, for your indication a meeting or two ago that, uh, or three, I can't remember now, uh, that we would identify, um, that your team would identify a, a sort of a lasting protocol for uh, review of various reports and policies uh, in the surveillance uh, arena. I, I just, uh, as I was reviewing today's uh, packet uh, over the weekend, I was thinking, yeah, we we need we need that sooner rather than later if we can. Any notion on when that might be possible? Well, we realize that basically district. Five has been doing all of our follow-up and uh, exploration and evaluation of our surveillance reports, and we're expecting that the privacy office will take over doing that okay, so. um, sooner rather than later, but I don't want to give you a specific time. Could we get an off-agenda report by such and such a date? Would that, would that work? Okay, we'll give you one by May 1st. <laughs> You said such and such. Yeah, no, that no, that's 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 fine. I, I okay. really, um, you know, in fact, I'll uh, I'll say, can we get an off agenda report by the end of May, just to sure make it uh, easy to learn. Thank you. I'm How about the end of trying June? Trying to try and take yes for an answer here, as we <laughs> say. Thank you. May sounded good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Absolutely. Seeing no other comments, let's move on to um, item 16, County Council's report. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of March 13, 2023. I did want to just make one other comment. I know this is um, 
Uh, as I understand, Paul Murphy's last meeting is a board aid, and I just wanted to acknowledge on behalf of the county council's office a couple of things. One is the extraordinary work that he did uh, in our office to transform the county's whistleblower program. Uh, really changed it uh, dramatically for the better for the entire county organization. And second, uh, I've always appreciated how he's reached out proactively, both uh, in my role as county council, but even before as a deputy county executive on uh, contracting items, especially uh, to proactively reach out with questions and try to get uh, issues resolved or raise concerns in advance. Uh, and that's something I've appreciated for many uh, many years and just his commitment to the county as an organization. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And that concludes my report. Thank you. And I want to, if I could, I just wanted to let everyone know um, that April 21st, we're going to bring a commendation and embarrass him whole hog. We're not, so I, I do really appreciate it. And it, and it is his last um, formal board meeting. But I, I will, you will all be invited to uh, embarrass him again. <laughs> I'm very proud of the work he's done and um, want to make sure we celebrate him. Thank you both. Item 17, pardon me, is the Valley Homeless Health Care Program Monthly Report. Good morning, President Ellenberg, members of the board, Celine Ho, Health Center Manager for the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. I also want to say congratulations to Paul Murphy as well. Um, in your board packet, we have our semi-annual update on the SB 1152 uh, compliance. And as you know, SB 1152 requires the hospitals to comply with certain requirements before discharging individuals um, experiencing homelessness. Our compliance remains steady across the three hospitals and we'll continue to monitor those metrics. Um, in addition, we also have our annual review of the, our sliding fee discount program as required um, by HRSA, also in your packet for your approval. And there's no changes to the discount program since it was last approved in fiscal year 2022. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Looking to colleagues for questions. Seeing none, I have just a, a couple then. Um, thank you, Celine and, and Paul Lorenz in, in absentia and, and staff across the system that have contributed to improving the discharge part protocols and reporting. The 1152 data is, is really greatly improved since first being presented in 2019, and I appreciate uh, the attention of staff to improve documentation and to timely assure that more, parent, more patients have what they need before they leave the hospital. Ideally, the levels of behavioral health assessment would be a bit higher. I understand that an assessment might not be indicated for all patients, but I do think it would be a value for that decision to be documented by the provider just so that we're sure uh, folks aren't being missed. And I'm wondering, Celine, are there strategies in development by the team to increase the assessment rate so that it's comparable with, with physical supports like offering meals or transportation? Yes, we are, kind of, we are looking into um, the health link system to see if we can create some hard stops um, for each of these categories so that they can't move forward unless they do these assessments before they're discharging the clients. And so we'll take a look at that to make sure that that's being done. Thanks, I appreciate that. And can you remind us of the, or at least me, the, the cycle of these SB 1152 reports? When, when would we expect to see yeah. the next one? Yeah, we're bringing these reports to you semi-annually. Oh, okay. All right, then, then if that can be included, what has been, what has been done in the, in the meantime to increase the, um, the number of mental health assessments as well would be great. Thank well, you. Good. Thank you very much. Do we have Supervisor Chavez? Yes, thank you. Um, just one thing, I'm, I'm so glad you asked those questions, Supervisor Ellenberg. One other um, indicator that's not required by the legislation, but one that I'd be interested in us figuring out how to gather is the number of, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna use the right word, but the, the number of complaints that we get for people being, um, you know, dismissed from a hospital, not the county hospitals necessarily, but any hospital in the county without these services, because I'm presuming that this law doesn't apply just to public hospitals or does it only apply to public hospitals? Celine, are you answering that? Um, I'm actually, I actually 
don't know if it's just for public hospitals. Could, um, as part of receiving the report, we ask staff to let us know the answer to that question and then to better understand how compliance is measured with other healthcare institutions because, well, for obvious reasons. Thank you. Can I jump in there and Please. clarify? Um, the other hospitals do not have uh, HRSA grants, so they're not held responsible for compliance by HRSA. But um, in terms of the clients themselves, um, we're, as a safety net hospital health system, um, obliged and welcome and encourage any participation. So I'm, I need clarify, clarification on exactly what you want. So this, the, the um, California Senate Bill SB 1152 um, is requiring hospitals in California. And so what I was curious about is whether or not all the hospitals in our county have to produce the same kind of report. And if so, can we access that so we better understand who is or isn't receiving these services? And so I'm just curious, do the other okay. hospitals have to do that? Now the, I get it. And this isn't related to HRSA, but the other reason I was raising it, Dr. Smith, is that we get feedback and complaints that patients are being let out without any services, and there's an assumption that they're all coming from our hospitals. And I'm not sure that's true based on this report. And so that's why I would be interested in knowing if the other hospitals are um, complying or have to. And second, if we can see their numbers as well so we better understand when we're getting feedback from folks who we should be sending them to, honestly. I get it. So you want to know whether they're complying with uh, SB 1152, um, which presumably are they are since they're told to, but you know we know from experience that doesn't always happen, but exactly. you're not asking whether they participate in HRSA grants. No. Okay, I got yeah. it. Just Thank wanted you. to clarify. You bet. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? Um, it's your direction, Supervisor Chavez, in a motion. So moved. Second. All right, let's take a vote, Rhonda. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 18 is a um, cust custody health services report regarding access to my health online after release from custody. Lunch at 1230. You need your mic on, Dr. Day. Nope. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. And good afternoon, President Ellenberg and Board of Supervisors. Eureka Day, Director of Custody Health Services. And I'm here today joined with some of my colleagues. Uh, we have at the far right, Antoinette Bonner, who is a program manager too. We have Irina Kalish, and she is our custody health services informatics nurse. And then we have Catherine Parlette, who is our program manager three. And we're here today to report on access to my health. And you do have our report, and so we'll be happy to take any questions on item 18. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Day, we were having a discussion, I know this is the weirdest setup here, um, in your absence, um, and just to say to you and your team, the dramatic improvements have been noticed, so thank you for that. Thank you, team effort. Um, so I, am, I have a, a few questions that I know my staff sent to you, but I'm just gonna run through them. Um, if a person who is already a client or a patient has an existing My Health Online account is arrested and treated by Custody Health while in jail, is the information entered into their My Health Online account? And Irina, do you want to take that or? 
Please turn on your mic as well. Thank you. No. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, once the patient access custody, uh, the My Health Online, if they have a My Health Online account, it will be inactivated while they are in um, custody. But once they are discharged from custody, the uh, My Health Online account will be um, activated. So we, they are inactivated if they're in our system when they come into another one of our systems. No, once they are discharged from custody, it will be activated. So as soon as they are discharged. Okay, but here's my point. My point is they're a patient of ours, they get arrested, and then we deactivate, we, their account is deactivated. And that's, is that because of Medi-Cal or some other reason? I'm not sure the reasons. Um, I can follow up on that, but um, I think at some point when we were piloting uh, the white card project, um, they, they they were accessing my health online to uh, submit requests, and so that way um, they cannot access anything outside of custody related healthcare uh, information. The account was inactivated, but I don't know if it was inactivated. You know. Previously, I would have to follow up. So on here's that. what I'm going to hey. look to you all. I'm going to end. I can answer yeah. the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, the reason they have to be separated is because of confidentiality. There's certain bits of information that are in the custody account that should not be accessed by um, other individuals outside of custody, outside of healthcare in custody. So, for example, um, you know. The mere fact that they're incarcerated is um, not supposed to be something that people can search for from the hospital through HealthLink. Mm -hmm. And then there could be CEGIC data or related data that's in there. So we needed from a confidentiality perspective to keep them separate. And then there's also mental health data that has to be segregated. So that's why there's two accounts, one to use while they're in custody, another one to use outside of custody. So I'm going to share a concern, and that concern is that, um, well, first of all, if you're arrested, that, that data is public. So I don't understand where, I don't understand what the confidentiality is in that environment. It's a matter of where you get the information from. It's not from your medical record. See, anybody, the way HealthLink works is basically anybody in the health system can access any patient unless there's a restriction put on them. So we looked at the ability to restrict access because of custody issues that were important, um, but we couldn't restrict it in pieces, so we had to create two systems. But we can give you... A more detailed report. What I would request is that through county council, we actually understand the if there are legal limitations, what those legal limitations are rooted in, and that that would be part of my request for for this because I obviously we want to be able to provide the best health care services we can. And for people who already have a hard time with their health, the idea that people are using multiple systems to access their information is just a concern that I have. And so rather than guess, I, I guess I would just really want to understand concretely under what circumstances, what information can't be shared with what party. And be, uh, yeah. if, if I can and, add to that, an yeah. interesting complexity is that we are advocating heartily for an exemption to, for, for a change to the Medi-Cal um, exclusion. So if, if, if Medi-Cal coverage is permitted to continue, at, at the very least pretrial when someone is in custody, that's the same account that they have externally. So I'm also surprised that there are all of these barriers to keeping the same system running as opposed to walling off certain small bits of information. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Greta, who's spent most of her career over the last 10 years working on <laughs> confidentiality and limitations about sharing information. She can tell you that there's 
copious limitations that are written into the code that don't make much sense. And Greta, and Greta God bless you, and I'm happy to hear that. But if you can also answer what, what will happen with the Medi-Cal, because this, this is really a prelude to it. Yeah, let me see if I can um, help a little bit by separating out a few things, and then there may be some information that folks on the panel can augment. Um, so one issue that's a policy issue that has been considered is how do we make sure that when someone's in custody and they're receiving treatment in custody, that the fact that they were in custody doesn't follow them forever through the life of their medical record. So think about a juvenile who receives treatment from one of our clinics. And so we came up with ways to ensure that important medical information would be appropriately documented in their chart, known to their provider, um, as, I, as I understand it, when they're released from custody, but not in a manner that would um, then follow them forever. And so folks can probably speak more precisely to that, or we can get you an off agenda around exactly what's been done to address that concern. But I know that's a concern that's been top of mind. Another one um, that uh, has uh, implication not only in custody, but in general, is the requirements associated with 42 CFR around substance use treatment information um, and how we ensure appropriate compliance with the unique privacy protections that are beyond HIPAA that apply to that sort of treatment information and that are designed to make sure that if somebody wouldn't, for example, want their primary care doctor to know that they're separately receiving substance use treatment services, um, that there's some additional protections that attach there and so that we're compliant with those regulations, how that specifically um, is playing out currently in the way that we're um, documenting information in custody where folks are receiving um, those services is something that I think the staff on the panel um, can speak to more specifically. And then um, finally, I think one of your questions was also how, how do we make sure that when folks come into our custody, if we have a lot of medical information about them and what their needs may be, that custody health staff have appropriate access to that. And then likewise, if there are treatment concerns that occur in custody when they're transferred back to our system of, of non-custody-based care, how is that information being transferred? So I think some of those points may be able to be addressed by staff, um, but that's what I was hearing from your comments, and anything that we don't address today, we can come back to you with an off-agenda. Okay, and thank you, Greta. And I, if I could speak to that, and um, what Greta had mentioned are, is very true with the uh, 42 CFR, which is a higher level of confidentiality, especially around substance use and abuse and treatment, and then restricted um, records while the patient is in custody. Some of that also is a safety and security because one of the capabilities of the My Health is that family members also can pick, you know, get those records and pull them up. We often have patients that are going back and forth to Valley Medical Center, and so that's a safety and security um, reason, too, that those records are restricted. But they're not deactivated. They're just restricted while they're in our setting, and then they're act they, um, we actually just get them back on track uh, when they're released. So, it, so ultimately, let me just say what my objective is. My objective is that we're able to provide the highest quality of care to anybody who's in any of our systems. That's really the outcome. And so I just want to make sure I understand this. So I, if I'm in custody, so my health record um, is not accessed. My health online is not accessed. It's not deactivated, but you said not used or? Restricted. So if I'm, in, um, I'm an in-custody nurse or doctor, I can't access the my health online that my client has? Like I can't access their records? No, the patient cannot access. The healthcare providers can access information in the health link. So when the My Health for the patient to get their records and their information upon release, uh, we provide them that information on how to register and get their own personal information. But during the course of their care, healthcare and our providers, we are able to access the record. So if I'm I'm a patient, Kaiser, or, or let me just stay with My Health Online to not make this complicated. So My Health Online, I come into custody. I can't access it because I'm restricted in what, I, what information I can access out in the world, but my health care provider can look at my records while I'm sitting in their That's office. Correct. Okay. And the patient doesn't have access to a computer or anything. Right. Well, they have a, a tablet, but they don't have access tablet. to... They don't have the access to okay. the icon. Okay. That's helpful. So it's, an, it's not... I, the, okay, so it's not disengaged or ending. Okay, so then the, doc, the medical professional can update my health online 
we can update all information. And we do that now? Yes. So I'm, I'm patient, my health online, I, uh, the doctor or nurse, whoever's updating it, can, it, updates my health online. And when I leave, my health online is updated with all information relative to the services that I received while I was in custody. That's correct. And part of that is what we call the AVS, the after visit summary. And so all the current information is also put on that discharge list that, in, that has that link to the My Health. And so diagnosis, medications, any upcoming appointments, specialty appointments, all of that information, the patient leaves with that information as well. So with My Health Online then, just to ask the hairy question that um, Greta raised, if I'm receiving um, mental health services in custody, that stays in my... I, I feel like a Seinfeld episode, my permanent record. So that stays in my permanent record. So when I leave and I go to see my doctor, they see all my medications and all the services I received except um, any drug and alcohol counseling. Is that accurate? Uh, for the drug and al alcohol, um, they, the patient can give permissions and release of information for that information to be shared. But it's not entered into that record because because it's not allowed to be unless the patient opts in with their medical provider? No, it is, the work that is being done under substance use and abuse is documented in the record, but what I'm saying, it takes a higher level of confidentiality as well as a higher level to of release be able to of access information it. for it to be released. How do, can you operationalize that? Like, so when you say to be released, so I go to see my medical provider after I'm out of custody and and I don't disclose that I have, a, have been getting a treatment for substance abuse treatment. So my medical provider wouldn't know that based on the record that the updated, there would be no updated record available to that person because I didn't allow them to know that. So the patient would give those um, informations it is in the record, and once uh, we get a request for a release of information, uh, depending on where uh, the patient is going, they will send a request of release of information, and we'll be able to provide that information. So my health online, I, so it, is the doctor that's treating me in custody updating my health online with that information that I'm getting substance abuse yeah, treatment? I'm gonna defer to our informatics nurse. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so um, my health online, it's just the application used by patient mm -hmm. and- it's So the doctor doesn't use it? No, doctors use HealthLink. Everything we that is documented in HealthLink by custody provider, either it's a clinician, a nurse, a, pro a psychologist, psychiatrist, it is all visible and accessible by our county providers in the clinics or in the uh, hospital system. So as soon as they op pull up the patient's chart, they can access custody encounter, they can see through chart review, they can see all of the notes, any orders that were placed on the patient, um, so they have access to all of that documentation. My so health the doctor knows, well, I, I understand what you're saying, my health online, I, I get it now, thank you. Mm -hmm. But So my medical doctor knows I was in custody. Correct. And they know from looking at my medical records that I got substance abuse treatment. Correct. And the reason my health online doesn't have access to it is because somebody else other than the patient may be able to access it. Is that the distinction? Uh, when patient is in custody in or case. when patient is discharged? Once they're discharged. Once they are discharged, it doesn't matter. It, there is limit. There is certain information on my health on uh, line right. for any patient. Doesn't matter if they were ever in custody mm -hmm. or not. Right. And it's usually their lab results, medications, future. Yeah, I'm, I use my health online. I'm a yeah. BHP member, so I yes. got you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then there, are, there is a new feature where certain notes can be also released unless the provider specify why they don't want to release the note to the patient. Um, and that's uh, that's you know, a separate thing. But yeah, it's, they can access a lot of things on My Health Online, correct, after they are released. Okay, um, so essentially Epic keeps the record. My Health Online downloads it during the, whatever's, whatever is normally given to a patient is available to me when I leave. Okay, and then, um, so, 
so that means that if I had a lab in, in custody, I could see my lab results outside of custody. And the only thing that, that is abated is my access to my health online while I'm in custody. Correct. But That's not correct. the updating of the information. Correct. correct. Okay. And then, um, and then the last thing that I, I just want to make sure I understand, and you brought up an issue that I'm, I'm sure you didn't mean to. I mean, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole, but I just want to make sure I understand this. Mm -hmm. So the medical professional, um, there are, well, let me ask it this way. So Dr. Day, earlier in this discussion, you said that there were limitations to my health online because other people could access it. Is that, did I understand that properly or were you maybe referring to? So one of the capabilities, and we can confirm, but one of the capabilities of the My Health is that information including family records can be accessed. And so if the patient gives that information to a family member, they're able to pull up those records while they're in custody. And so for safety and security reasons, that's another reason why patients are not accessing My Health while they're in custody. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, that's a really important point. I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Thank you for letting me dive into that. I wanted to make sure I under, understood the interface and the difference, so thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, On. Um, <clears throat> this is the classic on the one hand, on the other hand case. It, uh, no, because uh, I remember Supervisor Alvarado and I were struggling with this 20 plus years ago as we talked about the importance of information sharing mm -hmm. because you can't really have a conversation about what today we would call whole person care if you don't have all of the data about all of the different pieces of somebody's life. On the other hand, as Ms. Hansen reminded us, it, re it raises very significant and I would say numerous as well, privacy concerns and considerations. Uh, and how you balance those two is always gonna be a source, I think, of some healthy tension. Um, let me just take the opportunity and turn and look at Dr. Smith and say, yet another reason why we need a robust privacy office that is fully staffed sooner <laughs> rather than later, uh, but I remember being in a health committee meeting sometime in the last decade uh, where we had a conversation about just the fact that somebody had received treatment um, in our criminal justice system meant that the, 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 the clinic or the provider uh, had an ID number on the record and anyone who knew that the number was the jail could figure out, okay, this is a person who's been in jail. Uh, and then to the point, you know, never mind what the various legal requirements are, then to the point that Ms. Hansen raised in passing, you, you have to ask yourself, do you want someone's criminal justice history to follow them into every doctor's office for the rest of their lives? Um, and I, I, I just think it's a tough one. So um, I, I, I just hope that as we're addressing these issues going forward that will look sort of not only at the legal issues and constraints, but the policy issues uh, and challenges there, and that folks will try and find a way to balance the concern that's been articulated about making sure people can access the records they need for their healthcare uh, purposes, but balance those with the legitimate concerns people will have about privacy. We've spent a lot of time talking about re-entry and how to give people a second chance and uh, it would be a painful irony indeed if we ended up getting in our own way on that. I guess I'll just put it that way. Thank you. So you asked me, so I'll give my two cents. Um, so there are really sort of three ways, standard ways to access the information that's in EPIC. One is through the provider's you know, visit in our health system. So they put in medical records, which are charts and you know, prescriptions and other information. And that goes into EPIC. And any 
provider with appropriate you know, credentials can access that. There's also a way that outside systems who also function on Epic like Kaiser, PAMP, um, others can get access to Epic. That requires more complexity. I don't need to go into that, but once they get access, they can see everything that's in there. Then there's the My Health Online, which is the access from the patient or family portal, and that's restricted. But the question is, you know, some of this information has one level of privacy and some of it has others. So there's obviously personal health information, which we're all familiar with, which is governed mostly by HIPAA. But then there's also psychiatric and substance abuse information, as Greta mentioned, which has increased requirements for privacy. And then we have um, court information, like for example, juvenile justice, you know, the juvenile juveniles who are in our quote custody are actually called wards of the, st of the county. And there's requirements about what information can be shared there. And then there's also um, the child protective services issues and foster care issues where they also have a whole different set of requirements. So it's a matter of trying to make sure only the people who need it, who are authorized, get it. But it's not a simple task. Supervisor Simidian, anything additional? It's a lingering uh, light. Do we have comments on this item? Did we have a motion? Did we need a motion? I think this, can, James, can you remind me? Just This was just to receive? No motions needed to receive report. All right, then we will, um, let's see. Yes, I believe the, jet, the uh, lead screening item is likely to take more than five minutes. So we're going to break now for lunch and we will come back at 12.15. Susan, I, I think this one, oh. this one is, is my request. You got I, it. I just have a quick direction so folks are okay. I don't want these folks to have to wait. Absolutely, let's All do right. number 19. Thank, thank you. you. I, I just want to start by saying thank you for the progress. Um, and I, I want to just confirm the, pro, the, the uh, pilot project will start in April. That's correct. That's great. And then, um, one thing that I would love to get off agenda is just what, what it means to have a successful project, like how will you measure a, a pilot's effective or not, and I'm, and I'm sure there are some components to that you'll want to give some, some thought to and probably already have. Um, and then what I'd like to ask is that the, I know the first report comes in early 2024, but I'd like to request that Public Safety and Justice Committee also receive a report in August, as you should have three or four months of data, and mostly just to understand where we are uh, if there are any problems with the pilot. And um, I think, Susan, are you okay with that? So uh, let me tell you my thoughts here. All of the, the juvenile justice items, I, I think, should stay in CFSC oh, okay. because, and I'll just yeah. finish for anybody else that's interested in our conversation, just the entire um, juvenile justice system was moved a couple of years ago out of um, the the criminal legal system at large at the state and into HHS. So I think as we talk about juvenile justice and those issues that it's more appropriate to put them in the health and human services than with the rest of our um, public safety and justice. Items. Great. So that would be uh, my We'll preference. have it in August at Children's Family Seniors. Thank you. Any other um, comments from anyone? All right, any public commenters? Let's vote. It's already coming to your committee, right? Or did you need to ask for Just that? for August, and okay. um, and then just an off agenda on the pilot, pilot, and I would move approval. And I'm happy to second. And let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. All right, thank you. We will, we will pause right now at 1228, and we will uh, Gavel back in at one o'clock.
Mic check one, two. Test, testing. Okay. Mic check one, two. Mic check one, two. Moving it around. Mic check one, two. Mic check one, two. Mic check one, two. Microphone check one, two. Check one, two. Okay. I guess the people I'm sorry, you said that? I was saying I'm not picking up anything. Okay. Mic check one, two. My check one two. My body hurts. So yeah. It's what that time of the year where it's cloudy and so things going around. Mike check one two. Okay. Mike check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. This is where I was my first thought because it was in the beginning and I only ever saw it when her mic was live, so that was my hypothesis. It sounds okay, I'm not hearing you. No, uh, we did take, um, I believe this is. Hold on, this, this is this mic. This one belongs to Arenas, right? Yeah, we're not using that one today. We're not using that one today. No, it wasn't when someone was up here. Mic check one, two. Sounds good. Mic check one, two. Mic check one, two. Mic check one, two. Mic check one two, mic check one two, say I did it, okay. Mic check one two, mic check one two, just a lot of gain, mic check one two, okay. Last mic check, last mic check, okay. All right, cool, sound card.
We are at one o'clock, and I am calling back to order this meeting of the Board of Supervisors. And Dave, let's take the roll to establish the continued presence of a quorum. Good afternoon. Uh, Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Simidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Present. And President Ellenberg? I am here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. And we are continuing with item 20, uh, which is a resolution for ambulance services contract requirements. And as a reminder, we're going to hear this item 20 along with item 42, which I believe requires a Levine Act disclaimer. That is correct. Item number 42 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Madam Chair. Supervisor Smithian. Thank you. Before we hear the item, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to say, uh, as just noted, that we have been advised that item 42 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, uh, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, I would ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, uh, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much. And do we have Dr. Uh, James? I'll handle item number 20. Item 20 is a follow-up to conversation we had with the board on February 7th. Uh, this is the resolution that was discussed uh, at some length then. Happy to answer any questions, but otherwise this is an implementation of the board's direction from that discussion. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? If I could maybe to just talk about the second item because there's some contradiction in them and I want to make sure I understand both Absolutely. together. Mm -hmm. sure. And I can clarify uh, perhaps. Item 42 is not um, in agreement in which the county's acting in a regulatory capacity. It's a contract for services that the county is um, purchasing, in essence, from rural metro. And so it's not governed at all under the same statutory scheme uh, or regulatory structure as the um, EMS contract for emergency medical services. Thank you. That, that may have answered my question, James. So it, on item, just to, to be clear, that means that on item 20, the um, EOA, the operating, the, to adopt item 20 means that we're adopting that countywide, where the second item we're not adopting countywide? Correct. So, so, so item number 20 is with respect to the um, ambulance services if you dial 911, mm -hmm. uh, and that would be true countywide. Uh, item 42 is a contract that for the county in its proprietary capacity acquiring interfacility transport services, um, not 911 public emergency response services. Got it. That's helpful. And then, uh, James, just if I could ask a couple of follow-up questions. So first of all, I wanted to thank the staff for the report. I thought it was very responsive to what the board was asking for, so, so thank you for that. Um, and what I was curious about is I was just looking at item 20 as a starter. Um, when this says uh, the exclusive operating agreement countywide, this, this state law and the rules that we're putting forward respond to every place in the county, including Palo Alto? Um, so Palo Alto is, is different because it's a grandfathered <laughs> jurisdiction. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, and there's a um, exemption under Section 201 of the e State EMS Act for certain cities or other areas that were providing pre-existing ambulance service on their own from the overhaul that was done, uh, I think, 
in the 80s, if I recall correctly, in the early 80s through the State EMS Act. So Palo Alto is what's known as a grandfathered Section 201 jurisdiction. And there are some pieces of regulation that apply there. For example, some of the same standards regarding um, protocols for medical care. But in terms of the operating procedures and rules, the county's regulatory um, EMS jurisdiction doesn't apply in the same way. So then, as it relates to item 20, though, this is an implementation of state law that would? That would not apply to Palo Alto. Oh, it doesn't apply to Palo Alto. No. No, this is just telling the community what the board thinks are the priorities for the RFP, but the RFP doesn't include Palo Alto. So that's, that's also true, but they're slightly different things. So the county executive is correct. The RFP would not include Palo Alto. In addition, this resolution, which sets um, basic regulatory criteria, also does not apply to Palo Alto. Okay, so but let me just dig at that just a little bit more so I understand this. Is that, um, so that means that the state, the state law, because I mean I'm looking at Assembly Bill 389, this, um, this particular rule because, because they're grandfathered, it, because they're pre-1980 uh, in terms of its establishment, then what governs Palo Alto? I mean, I to, I'm just curious now. So, so Palo Alto is um, Palo Alto is allowed to continue to operate its own ambulance services consistent with how it was before. If Palo Alto were to make certain changes in how it was structured, that could trigger um, them losing their grandfathered status, and then they would fall within the county jurisdiction. But that's a, it's a different regulatory scheme, and we can provide additional information on that separately if the board would like but you know what I think that let me just make this point because I, I don't want to I don't want to go down a tangent but some of these rules I thought were just really um, really thoughtful and you know especially around issues of equity and the like mm -hmm. and so perhaps the way to address what my concerns would be is just to make sure that as we, if the board decides to adopt this in the in its current format, that we just share that with Palo Alto. That would that would do my that would address what I was most concerned about. We could certainly share a copy of this. Yeah, that's with that's Palo all because I, I understand the. I, I was really just excited about some of the. Um, well, item three I thought was particularly interesting. So with that, let me go then to item forty two. And make sure I, so this is for the non-emergency component of our work. And there are two questions that I have. Um, one is that this is an agreement with Rural Metro. And, and my understanding is that we have, Rural Metro is not our only contractor that does this inner, uh, inner facility transport. <clears throat> right, that's operational, so <clears throat> I can try to address that. Um, Rural Metro is not the only um, provider that does inter-facility transport, but the market is such that one of our current providers is currently near bankruptcy, and we're trying to figure out a way to avoid that from happening, and the other providers um, are, shall I say, non-responsive, because inter-facility transport doesn't get reimbursed very well but it still costs a lot of money to run a system because you have to have paramedics and EMTs and all of the um, equipment, you know, ambulances and the like. <clears throat> so it's a statewide problem that small ambulance companies that have in the past focused on inter-facility transport are getting out of that business, being bought up by big EMS systems. So... In this instance, are we asking Rural Metro to also um, have an, a workforce incumbent policy? And the reason I'm asking that question is that if the point you're making is right, then that may mean that we have some EMTs that are going to be out of work, potentially, and we're expanding work for Rural Metro, is the way I understand what you just said, Dr. Smith. 
You mean if they, if the, if Rural Metro was to buy out smaller um, ambulance companies? Well, not just buy them out. So let me let me just add as an example. Um, we have one ambulance service that we've been doing work with, and I think it's the they're called Royal. Royal. There is Royal, Westmed Royal, and others. It's, and it's unclear to me as to whether or not they're following our living <clears throat> wage policy, as an example. And so I assumed, based on what you just said, that maybe the reason for that, not that there's an excuse, but one is we should follow up and make sure they are following our living wage policy. So I'll just put that on the record today that I'd love a report back on that. But second, it made me curious about the way we were pursuing this particular contract, because what I'm, what I'm wondering is, as we do an RFP or an RFQ, given the changing market, would we want to make both um, the inner facility as well as the emergency response um, part of one bid in an attempt to get a more, um, a, you know, a stronger, A, a stronger response, but one that was more economically strong for, for us as a, as such a big purveyor of services. Yes, we're looking into that. So um, the action we take today will not... Will not affect that. Okay, that was unclear to me from this. This, this is really just an extension. Well, it's retroactive, but it's an extension amendment of current contract to try to make up for the situation where we're having less responsiveness from smaller companies doing inter-facility transfers because... We do have lots of transports between hospitals now that we're responsible for between clinics and the hospital, and also um, a very large and increasing number of transports from custody to hospitals. So uh, we want to make sure that we have this contract in place so we can reliably get uh, a call answered in an appropriate period of time. But when we're going through the RFP process, <clears throat> the intent is to suggest that as, a, as an option for a bidder to include both emergency transport and non-emergency transport. Perfect, so they both, they both end in June 2024, while, and presumably that'll get us, the RFP we're doing now will align with June of 2024, or frankly not June, yeah. but earlier for the board. Well, we hope so. As you remember, last time we went through the RFP process, we had a lot of problems with the state EMSA. Um, first of all, they didn't like our RFP, then they uh, made us rebid, and then we didn't have, a, we only had one bidder, um, and that one bidder was significantly more expensive than our current system, current contract. So. The intent is to accomplish exactly what you said, but I'm a little nervous that with the shrinking business structure that um, we'll probably only get one or two bids at the most. And then I would just say um, I'm happy to move both items and to, if I can take them together. Um, and then, and I see you weighing in. I, I just wanted to add that I want to um, ask staff to, I'm reinforcing two things. One, that we're going to do um, a, uh, you know, some sort of an audit for Royal to make sure they're paying to the standard they're supposed to, uh, which is our living wage policy. And then the second is that, um, that what I'm being told on the record is that these both align, giving us the opportunity to um, include this as a strategy for an RFP and then to reinforce that that would include a public option if available. I would be happy to second both if I can prevail upon my colleague to separate the items to ensure Levine Act compliance since one is Levine Act subject and the other is oh, not. Okay. <clears throat> so moved on, on the first item then, which would be item 20. Thank you. If it's all right, I would I'll do public comment on both items. Or sorry, yeah, so let's that'd be great. let's go to public comment on both items. But we'll take motions and votes. Could separately. I ask a quick question first, Madam Chair? Of course, because it may help inform public comment or not. Um, the only question I have uh, for both uh, uh, Dr. Smith and um, County Council James Williams is 
Uh, is there anything in uh, the language in item 20, I didn't see it, if it's there, but is there anything that uh, affects the ability of um, fire agencies to participate in the process? Some of you will recall that literally several years ago, um, we had uh, interest expressed by folks in the fire uh, department world that the chief's association uh, in um, proposing another model. More recently, we've heard from the chief, uh, fire chief in San Jose on this issue. I think in the conversations we've had in uh, health and hospital, you know, we've been pretty clear about the fact that we sort of want all options on the table, understanding that Dr. Smith, if I may characterize his comments over the years, has been pretty clear with us that he doesn't think that model is a good fit for Santa Clara County in the current day and age. I just want to make sure that whatever it is we're doing today doesn't in some way preclude folks from participating in the process. No, it does not. <clears throat> it just says that they have to demonstrate that they comply with items one through 10 um, and nothing in there precludes the fire departments from approaching and I'll keep my personal opinion out of it. Always value your professional judgment, Dr. Smith, seriously, on this item. And yes, this is the public option to which um, there was reference. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate getting that uh, into the conversation. Of course, Supervisor Chavez, did you want to add anything before public comment? Do we have any public speakers on items? 20? Help me with the numbers, Dave. 20 and 42. 20 and 42. We have no speakers on either of those items, Madam Chair. Okay, then I will return to my colleagues and look for a vote on the first item, which is the, the motion on item 20. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4-0. Thank you very much. And does anyone want to propose a motion on item 42? I will move item 42 with a request to staff to follow up on the compliance with our living wage policy with our other providers. I'll second that. Any questions or comments? Let's vote on that. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4-0. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are moving on to item 21, uh, which is a report on the inmate tracking system. And good afternoon to Sheriff's Office folks. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, Captain Michelle Asbin will be speaking on behalf of the Sheriff's Office for this project. Sitting along um, beside me is Lieutenant um, Joseph Nguyen, and we will be available to answer any questions that you have. Welcome, thank you very much. Colleagues, is anyone interested in a presentation or would you like to go right to questions? I have one quick comment and then I'm prepared to it. make a motion. Okay. Uh, Captain, Lieutenant, thank you. Um, I wanted to say I appreciated the reference in the uh, staff report uh, or the legislative file from uh, the sheriff to uh, rev making sure to work collaboratively with, among others, the privacy office. Uh, I keep uh, looking down the dais and Ms. Hansen keeps looking in the other direction when I do, so I, uh, fair enough. And, uh, but I also wanted to call out the importance of working with our Office in Cor of Correction Law Enforcement monitoring the, so the OCLEM folks. Um, I know your department has been working with them. I have been very gratified to hear that that relationship is a whole lot more robust than it was previously. This is another one of those areas where I would ask uh, that that um, connection not be uh, uh, shortchanged. So I'm happy to move the recommended action, which is simply to receive the report and uh, with a further um, request of the department to uh, ensure that they engage with OCLEM uh, on these matters, uh, which I think will help you pass muster with our board uh, when the issue comes back to us in other, bit, other times. Thank you. That's my motion. Thank you. A second from Chavez. Other comments? No, um, I, I have a couple of two uh, questions as well, Captain and Lieutenant, thank you. And um, to Supervisor Simidian's point, to ensure that everything passes muster. 
uh, when, when the board approved this item in September, uh, my colleagues supported my request that the sheriff's office gather feedback about the proposed new tracking system from people in custody. And per OCLEM's recommendation, report back regarding how people booked into custody and their attorneys would be able to validate the accuracy of the tracking rec records. And as I'm sure is clear, the request for feedback was made because I want to make sure that our board is doing our due diligence in addressing the concerns raised by CCLEM about potentially dehumanizing uh, impacts that the board created CCLEM for just such purposes. Neither of the requests to date um, have been fulfilled based on, on information in the ledge file. I recognize that, that this work to develop a critical infrastructure is already underway, um, but I wanna make sure that we get to uh, responsiveness. So regarding the first request, information um, collected from people in custody, um, I, I, I certainly see how that's challenging to do in advance before people are actually using it. But tell me, did the Sheriff's Office used to convene an advisory council of people in custody, and I'm wondering if that still exists or, or whether they currently gather feedback or if that's something that that the office would consider reconstituting because that might prove an effective way to gather the feedback that I'm looking for. Um, certainly the sheriff's office is willing to explore that, that option. Um, Supervisor, we do have Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda that said he can answer that question. Excellent, thank you Assistant Sheriff. Good afternoon members of the board. Uh, Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda, um, to answer your question, we did have to put the inmate advisory committee on kind of a hiatus during COVID. Uh, we are in taking the steps as, as we speak now to reinstitute that, um, that uh, committee. We found it very valuable. There was a lot of great things that came uh, when we uh, created that committee, and so we're going to get it back going very soon, actually. Soon within, thank you, I appreciate hearing that. Is this, are you, does soon mean weeks or months? I assume not days. Um, we're, we're really looking at weeks and it's really coming down to working with our uh, custody health and health department colleagues in making sure that uh, the safeguards we're gonna put in place to make sure that there's not transmission. Um, even, you know, because COVID is still very active and the reality is, is uh, if we can keep folks separated, um, at a proper distance, we should be able to reconvene in-person meetings for the uh, Inmate Advisory Committee. And we just wanna make sure that we're in line with our uh, colleagues to make sure that they're comfortable with it before we reenact the, uh, the committee. But, but again, we are very close to getting that done and I don't have a date yet, but um, I surmise it will be sooner than later. And, and where are you on developing and, and sharing a, a protocol um, for how that information can, will, be, will be validated? I understand that it certainly can work sure. in favor of, of people in custody and, um, and the reverse. So how is that process going and who's involved? So our custody facility administrations are involved. And so they're just putting together like where, where we would hold the meetings before we would hold at Elmwood, for instance, we would hold it in a visiting area, it's a large area. The key factor is that we're bringing inmates from all different groups, classifications, and areas in together in one place so that we can have a robust committee, uh, a good representation of all inmates. And so that can be challenging when there's different classifications. And so um, bringing them all together, making sure they're far apart uh, enough so that if there is a a uh, person that we don't know is yet um, maybe act positive, uh, that they're not gonna contaminate anyone else in that group setting, and that's, so that's the protocol we're working on putting together. Sorry, I wasn't clear. I meant the protocol about how the tracking information will be validated and used, my apologies. Understood. Um, so when we, when we get the committee back together, we'll bring to the committee the information associated with the inmate tracking system, and then we can go from that, from that point forward. And is there work in conversation with the, the public defenders or the district attorneys? Because I assume they will both have, um, potentially have interest in accessing that information about um, d tracking sure. uh, people in custody's whereabouts. I do appreciate that question, um, Supervisor Ellenberg. We hope to mirror um, the surveillance use policy 
of that of our um, inmate phone monitoring. Um, and there's a process already in place for that. So the vetting would um, still be this uh, similar. Uh, we have um, outside agencies such as um, other law enforcement agencies as well as the DA's office that um, request uh, phone recordings. So we hope the process would mirror that process as well for any records or data that we have on the uh, RFID. Thanks. So I'd like the, the board to get a report back on, on both items, the reconstitution of um, the advisory committee and um, what system you, you do end up uh, using for validation. And, and I, I would like there to be engagement and interaction with the public defender and the district attorney uh, to meet their needs. What is, I don't want to put a, um, you know, an artificial deadline or, or timing on you. What, what do you think makes sense in conjunction with the, with the rollout? Two months, three months? Um, can we get back to the office, to your office on that? <laughs> Absolutely. I will um, ask Auden Leung, my PSJC um, aide, to connect with you and let's agree on a date and then you can send that date to, to all of my colleagues so we're all on the same page. That's perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We have no public speakers, Madam Chair. Let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah. Supervisor Samidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Item 22, uh, Surveillance, Technology, and Community Safety Ordinance. Madam Chair, uh, I asked that uh, some of these items return to us after their initial uh, presentation, and uh, because I think we got something like 100 all at the same time, and I uh, made an effort to uh, call out a, a half dozen or so that I thought might be worthy of uh, greater scrutiny. Working on the theory, colleagues, that as much as I love this topic, you all perhaps might not be that enthused about walking through 100 uh, or so of them, painful point by painful point. Um, what I've tried to do today is focus on sort of two general areas, and if I may, Madam Chair, uh, unless there's a presentation, and I certainly don't want to curtail that if there is one, what I'd like to do is just uh, ask some questions uh, of the District Attorney's Office about the data extraction, examination, forensic tools, and software piece of this, which is 22AI, and then uh, some questions for the Sheriff's Department about uh, ALPR's automatic license plate reader technology, both A2 and then A4 and A5. A2 is the sort of county uh, technology, and then A4 and 5 is the technology being used in the city of Saratoga and the town of Los Altos Hills. And then um, as part of that exercise, uh, I very much appreciated the, uh, the OCLAM uh, report that we had, uh, and it was, again, a reminder to me of why I think it's so valuable for uh, the department to work as cooperatively and collaboratively with OCLAM as possible. So let me say thank you again to the department for that continuing commitment. Um, are the OCLAM folks with us uh, virtually, if not in the room? Yes, I am, Supervisor. Julie Rulin here for Oakland. Hi, Ms. Rulin. Thanks, thanks so much. And Ms. Rulin, if I mispronounce your name, please correct me uh, during the course of the day, okay, through the chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the District Attorney's Office, uh, colleagues, you will note we have um, both the actual documents themselves, the annual surveillance reports in our packets. For those who are working with packet pages, it's packet page 222. And then, of course, we also have the report from OCLAM uh, that uh, deals with uh, these various topics as well. And I know we have representative from the district attorney's office who's here. And Madam Chair, if you want to let them introduce themselves before I wade in, I would understand. I'll stop <laughs> talking even. <laughs> Brian, Brian, can you turn your mic on? Uh, 
Oh, no. Excellent. All right, thank, thank you. you. And I can make this miss nice and quick and easy for you, Mr. Welsh, because most of the colleagues I did uh, work, full disclosure, with some of the folks who are here to present today in a meeting with my office to tease out some of these issues. Uh, the one point that I noticed to that, uh, the OCLEM folks mentioned that I thought it was worth talking about a little bit today. Um, Ms. Ross, it says on uh, page five of the OCLEM report, packet page 215, and no reason to find it, just says, it's notable that the report about data extraction, it's notable that the report contains no quantification of the data extracted, examined, or shared, meaning how much of this was going on. And then it goes on to say, we understand that the district attorney's office will be supplementing its annual surveillance report to provide further details on the data retrieved and shared, as well as more specific information on the various audits performed to ensure the office's compliance with the surveillance use policy. Where do we stand on all that? Uh, I filed a report dated March the 7th. Hopefully it's become incorporated into the agenda packet, perhaps with the OCLEM item, where I address the specific comments uh, in the OCLEM report. I don't think I've seen it. Let me look to my staff. Mr. Baskell, have you seen it? Say again? All right, it should be in my binder, uh, but uh, given the plethora of paper and notes that I have, I have not yet uh, been able to find it, but I'll say thank you for that, and I will look at it. Does it indicate the number of occasions on which this has taken place? Yes, we estimated 140 forensic examinations, and we also laid out the recipient law enforcement agencies, both uh, county, uh, state, um, out of state, and federal. Got it. And then um, just a couple quick questions about some of the language in the actual report itself. The description uh, of under the annual surveillance report indicates that um, data extraction and examination forensic tools and software were used only in compliance with the board approved surveillance use policy. Then it says specifically, investigators in the district attorney's office, react task force, and authorize investigators employed by outside law enforcement agencies use the tools and software to extract, so on and so forth. Um, who are these authorized investigators employed by outside law enforcement agencies? I, I think you know from our earlier conversations, I get anxious whenever there's sharing that starts to take place. Well, I guess there's a distinction between a person using the surveillance technology and a person receiving the um, results of that technology. So for the task force, uh, this would be the REACT task force. They do collaborate with law enforcement officers from other police departments. Those individuals would have the opportunity to use some of the forensic tools. But more commonly, they will be the recipients of the data that is produced through the use of those tools. And the authorized investigators employed by outside law enforcement agencies refers to whom, if I may ask? Those would be the individuals with the various law enforcement departments that are receiving the data. And we did lay out in the supplemental the police departments where we sent the data. So within those departments, uh, the individuals assigned to that particular case would be the authorized individuals to access that data. Thank you. I will uh, look at the supplemental data. Sorry that that got lost in my shuffle here. I, I am anxious to know um, when the, you talk about sharing the data, is that the specific data that has been identified as relevant to a case um, after your folks have extracted it, or is it, are we handing over some device that, and hoping, forgive my concern here, but hoping that folks follow the rules once they have the device? Yes, I mean, there may be occasions where we have to turn over devices to another department for further examination, but that would be rare. Primarily, we're talking about the data that has been extracted, and either it's going to be provided to another agency in summary format, or the actual raw data may be turned over depending on the data in question uh, and how the data is going to be used. Yeah, I, I am, and again, Madam Chair, I've shared this with the folks who are at the days here. I am always 
anxious when we share with other departments or agencies who may or may not share this county's commitment to privacy protection and due process. And we know we've had problems in our own district attorney's office and in our sheriff's department over the years. And we know that to give credit where credit's due because the district attorney's office and the sheriff's department has, has disciplined uh, uh, the folks who have violated the, the, the policies or in some cases violated state law with respect to access and use of this information. But it happens. Um, fortunately, not often as far as we can tell, uh, but it happens. So I'm particularly anxious about that sharing and would just encourage your office to be as limited about that as you possibly can and to, uh, even if it's a little extra work, share what I'll call culled data rather than sort of provide an opportunity for someone to potentially abuse access. That, that's my concern. Uh, and then um, I was just uh, curious, uh, there's also a dis in the description a reference to the fact that when the tools and software were used consistent with board approved uses, uh, they did capture sound and information regarding certain members of the public who were not suspected of engaging in unlawful conduct. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that's about? And uh, obviously someone was thinking that it was relevant to share, so I'm curious what the implications are there. Well, that's going to involve examinations typically of cell phones or laptops, and those would be the, the, the devices commonly uh, examined by members of the task force, and they will be um, pulling from those devices the data that will have been authorized by the search warrant or within the scope of the consent given by the owner of that device. And depending on what we're turning over, whether it's um, social history uh, or um, text messages, videos, photographs, um, that could very well uh, include individuals who are not the target of the investigation. Uh, certainly within social media, when we're turning over um, anything that, that may uh, be recovered from the phone, uh, Facebook conversations, for example, that will likely include people who are not the subject of the investigation, but the photographs may still have relevant, uh, relevance to the investigation. And then presumably the party who was not engaged in any alleged or suspected criminal activity loses some of their privacy because they were interacting with, talking to, exchanging messages with somebody who is alleged or suspected, yes? That's accurate. Okay. All right, thank you. I don't think I have any other questions. I may, uh, after I get, get to the supplementary you filed and um, uh, if I do, I'll just reach out one-on-one -on -one or from my office. Thank you. Very good. Thank uh, you. Madam Chair, the rest of the uh, issues I wanted to look at and discuss a little bit with uh, the board today go to the issue of automated license plate readers and um, kind of in three different pieces, as I indicated, we have, uh, we have the yeah, there's just one unit uh, in our own department that is uh, described. And then we also have the sort of um, cooperative or collaborative arrangement with Saratoga and Los Altos Hills. Uh, both communities are in my district, of course. And some of you will recall we had fairly um, extended conversations about how we might accommodate the desire of those communities for ALPRs while still addressing um, privacy and due process concerns that a couple of us on the board uh, expressed concern about. Um, I do want to take uh, the opportunity to just lay out a, a concern going forward before we take action today, whatever action that turns out to be. I think the department is more enthusiastic, optimistic about the efficacy and utility of ALPRs than I am. 
fair enough, difference, difference of opinion. I also think the department is less concerned about, sensitive to uh, the privacy and due process implications. Um, now, you know, I say some of that based on what we have before us today. Some of that is based on conversations we've had at the board level previously. Some of that is based on conversations we've had under different leadership. But I just, I think it's important to just sort of lay it out there. The department thinks that this is a more useful tool than I do, quite frankly. And the department, I think, is less concerned about some of the location privacy issues that have been discussed uh, in, in prior sessions uh, than I am. Fair enough, that, you know, that's the nature of the conversation. I was appreciative of the fact that in the report from the OCLEM folks, and this is um, the report in our packets at packet page 211, dated March 14th, 2023, for today's meeting date. I just want to read a little bit from packet page 217. Uh, and this, again, is the OCLEM report. The concern about AP ALPRs is less about its use to investigate these types of crimes uh, that are referenced above, and more about its potential as a mass surveillance technology that collects information on every car and driver on the street, the overwhelming majority of whom are not involved in criminal activity. In the aggregate, the data collected can reveal detailed driving patterns or potentially identify the drivers in particular locations. While there are uses for ALPR data that have commercial value or the potential to benefit the environment and public health, other uses could unfairly target marginalized populations or have political implications. In short, the technology holds great potential. At the same time, it poses a significant threat. Two examples of recent use of ALPR data in other jurisdictions include a state government identifying out-of-state cars whose drivers may have been violating COVID quarantine policies and officials tracking cars that entered an area around the same time of Black Lives Matter protests. And then um, there are a number of bullet points that uh, are raised. I thought that was, uh, you know, I, I might see it a little bit differently, but I thought that was a fair attempt by the Oakland folks to do their version of what uh, we all know is my on the one hand, on the other hand. Yeah, it's a useful enough tool in some regards, uh, but it raises some concerns. And the question, uh, and forgive me because I'm going to be bouncing around from three different policies, or excuse me, reports, uh, and, and also the OCLEM uh, analysis. Looking at the uh, OCLEM analysis, it, um, it notes at page 10, packet page 220, data collected by ALPRs that has not been flagged for association with any crime or investigation is purged from the cloud-based storage every 30 days. Is that correct? Yeah, good afternoon, President Elberg, supervisors, hope everyone's doing well. Captain Ricardo Urena here with the Office of the Sheriff. To my right is Captain Neo Valenzuela. Okay. And to answer your question, Supervisor, that's correct. After 30 days, the data is purged. Okay. And has that been happening over the course of the past year? I'm, I'm like looking at you for a public affirmation that that's really happening. Yes, it has. Thank you. And um, it, the same report uh, at the same packet page 220 goes on to say that data that has been flagged, meaning flagged in connection with a possible crime or investigation, is deleted after six months unless it is associated with an ongoing criminal case or a court has ordered its retention. Has that been happening as well over the last year? Yes, it has. Okay. And how do we know that? Is there an audit process that actually ensures that that happens? And if so, could you describe yeah, um, it briefly in late? I can give you an example of, of that. Sometimes our, our detectives are looking for information that occurred 
over four weeks ago that they're, it's not available. And, and, and so that's, that's actually been brought to my attention a few times. And, but is there an, is there a, an audit process? Does somebody say, hey, let's go check the, the cloud and make sure that the data is no longer there? Yeah, we could always do that. We can always check just to go back 30 calendar days just to see if there's anything there. But uh, for the most part, every time we try to query anything past 30 days, it's not available anymore. Sure. And, and Captain, I'm, not, I'm really not trying to trick you here, but I'm, I'm trying to find out if that hasn't been a routine part of your audit process, I, 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 I'd like to encourage you to make it a routine part of the audit. And I see some of your colleagues moving around behind you. Can we make sure, maybe we can get an off agenda report as to whether that has been a routine part of the audit process and uh, whether or not going forward it will be? Absolutely. All right, and could we get that within the next two weeks? Yes, we can. Thanks, and, and the concern here again for everybody is, I am, uh, I am not an absolutist on these issues. I, I, uh, I think finding that balance, threading the needle, whatever other cliche I could trot out, is a hard task. But, uh, you know, I understand there's a need to keep folks safe. I believe we can keep folks safe and still respect their privacy and their due process, but it means we gotta be mindful of both. And I understand you all are mission driven in the department and you're, you know, focused on keeping people safe and also catching bad guys. And that's a righteous cause in my view, but I think it can and should be done while we're mindful of the privacy and due process concerns. So if we can get that report and, you know, if it hasn't been a routine or institutionalized part of the audit process in some way, would love to see if we can make that happen going forward. Cause that'll have, frankly, very bluntly, it'll have implications for what I can and can't support uh, in the future, okay? And then um, uh, to give credit where credit is due, I should indicate that the OCLAM report goes on to say, these security and retention measures meet or exceed legal and industry standards. So that's a good thing and I wanna be fair about uh, mentioning that. Um, I am, Looking now at the two, excuse me while I flip my pages, Madam Chair. Um, so looking at the town of Los Altos Hills and also the city of Saratoga, um, and this is the annual surveillance report provided by um, the Sheriff's Department under effectiveness in achieving its identified purpose. And I'm highlighting this, Madam Chair, because you will recall that part of this process is an assessment of whether or not the cost benefit, whether or not the benefits outweigh the costs. And um, that's a determination our board is specifically called upon to make under the ordinance. And I'm gonna read for, first from Saratoga and then virtually identical, if not identical, language from Los Altos in the surveillance uh, reports. Um, I, item five, this is Saratoga. The identified purposes of the fixed ALPR technology is to alert law enforcement of stolen vehicles and plates to assist in locating vehicles involved in Amber Alerts, missing persons, and individuals associated to crime. And then, in Los Altos Hills, um, identical language, on packet page 235. And what I wanna say, gentlemen, to you and to your department is, I'm not sure I think that's altogether accurate. Um, I think the passing reference to uh, identifying individuals associated to crime is, is probably fair. But I remember very well the interplay between my office and these two communities, which I represent and have done for quite some time. And I remember as well the conversations we had uh, as a board on this subject. And primarily what was going on here was that people in these communities perceived themselves to be at risk of an increase uh, in crime in their neighborhood. There was some debate about the numbers, but I understood that was it. And when we heard from them and from your department, the rationale for accommodating the desire of these local communities was that the cameras would in fact 
serve to deter crime, mostly residential burglaries, and help identify and capture suspects. And so that's a very different, the Amber Alert's you know, worthy cause, obviously, missing persons, worthy cause, obviously, um, stolen vehicles and plates, bad stuff, want to, you know, glad that that's it. But that's not really what, the, what this ALPR technology was advertised. And I'm, I'm getting at this because there's this tension again between the, the real utility of these and the sort of conversation that takes place in the board chamber and in the community and I guess the question I would ask you is, do you think you could tie any decrease in crime to the use of these, these ALPRs? Because I'm not seeing that in the materials we have. Thank you for that question, Supervisor Samidi. And so just to kind of backtrack a little bit, uh, during the conversations with both our uh, Los Santos Hills City Council and the Saratoga City Council, uh, it was clear to us that this was a tool uh, that both cities felt was um, a tool that could help us investigate crime. Specifically, as you mentioned, our residential burglary rate, as uh, the goal has always been to try to reduce those countywide. Um, and so once the license plate readers were in fact approved, uh, we made it clear to folks in the community as well as the council that this was gonna be a tool for us, meaning that this was not gonna be a solution to stop all crime, much like having a good conversation with the witness, it was a tool for us. Um, and I will be completely honest, we were hoping that the tool would be a little bit better for us, because uh, we have seen a slight increase in our burglaries in, this, in these two cities. However, from the beginning, um, I think the expectation that we put forth was that it was gonna be a tool that was gonna be used by our office, and quite frankly, it has been used by our office to solve some crime. Um, I will note that these reports, uh, the, the city of Saratoga report, really only captures data for, I wanna say three months, because it was put online in May, and this report covers May through June. So it was a relatively new uh, piece of equipment we were using in the city of Saratoga. The town of Los Altos Hills, um, I believe it was a six month report as well. Um, and so the data you're looking at is, is really only a fraction of the calendar year. Uh, we have seen more success recently uh, with the license plate readers. Uh, it is our goal to come back to the board every year and provide a summary like we did in these two reports of some of the success stories that, that we feel are in fact beneficial for us. I'm going to be able to make the finding that uh, we are obliged to make about cost benefit analysis in the case of Saratoga and Los Altos Hills because essentially they paid for the product, right? So that means that the cost financially to our county is pretty modest, relatively speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm highlighting that distinction because as I look out at your colleagues in the off audience here, uh, you know, if we see proposals in the future for uh, substantial expansion in the county, I think you got a hill to climb, frankly, uh, in terms of burden of proof that uh, on the cost benefit analysis, given what we've seen in these communities, and let me go to the third report, Madam Chair, if I may, which is, uh, and we talked about this at a prior meeting, so I won't belabor it, but uh, on the ALPR technology for the office of the sheriff, not one of the cities or towns, um, there was, as I understand it, only one ALPR device, uh, and it was down for about a month and a half uh, over a 10 month period, but even so, in the remaining eight and a half months of operation, there were in fact 16,000, I'm looking at packet page 226, 16,438 license plate images. And I'm reading directly from the Sheriff's Department's report and I appreciate their candor. Of those images captured, excuse me, of those images captured, three license plate images were identified as fitting within the stated criteria. That's three of 16,438, however, all three were misreads. So three out of 1,600, 
for 16,438, only three identified, the three were misreads, so effectively we're looking at zero out of 16,438, fitting the stated criteria over a 10 month or to be fair, eight and a half month period. Am I reading all that right? You certainly are, sir. Okay, so I'm, I'm just saying, uh, given the concerns that Oakclam raised about the potential for misuse and colleagues just, you know, I'm usually not a ripped from the headlines kind of guy, but the uh, Daily Post has uh, just reported that uh, the town of Atherton, the headline reads, town sued for mistake by license plate reader, because while your report takes pains to say, hey, we're only looking at the car and the license plate, we're not profiling by individuals, once somebody gets stopped, erroneously, in this case, because there was dirt on the plate, apparently. Um, once somebody gets stopped, anything can happen, and sometimes that anything is a bad thing for either your officers or for, in this case, allegedly, uh, the community member. Um, I've got a policy question, and if you wanna phone a friend or look over your shoulder, I'll understand uh, here in a minute. Um, and it's a, an issue I mentioned in passing uh, in a prior conversation with the department. Um, historically, the argument, and I, you, I may pull the county council in much to his uh, delight, I'm sure. Um, historically, when I said, well, okay, does a member of the public have the ability to simply request, file a public record, California Public Records Act request, on, you know, show me what you've got on me. Could be Supervisor Ellenberg, could be Supervisor Chavez, could be me, could be the county council saying, I'd like to know what you have in your database since you've been taking all these images. Um, the Sheriff's Department's position was that uh, pursuant to what I believe was called active investigation or investigative authority, <clears throat> that they would not release that information. I found that intellectually inconsistent with the argument that the Sheriff's Department previously, different leadership, was making, which is, hey, you're out in public, this is your, you know, your whereabouts is a matter of public knowledge, you can't really say it's all that confidential if you're out driving around and people see you. Okay, I understand the logic of that argument, but then it seemed to me that if that's the argument, the information can't be confidential is the argument we're getting. Okay, well then if it's not confidential, please release it pursuant to a California Public Records Act request. Then the answer was no, it's actually um, information we're gonna keep close using the investigative uh, uh, exception in the CPRA request. And then we say, well, is it actually part of an investigation? The answer is not a specific one. Anybody wanna help me with that and tell me where that issue stands today in the Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. So um, the government code uh, you're referencing is 6254F, um, and that does, in fact, uh, relate to open investigations. Um, it is important to note that even deputies must have a reason and a case number to perform any search on the license plate reader system. So folks can't just go into the system because somebody's, somebody wants to know if this particular person was in the area. Every single search has to have a case number and a reason for that. And those are the audits that we perform internally to make sure that we safeguard the information. We realize that there's a lot of information at our disposal, so we put our policies in place so that we can make sure that our staff are following those policies appropriately. So when somebody's asking for a license plate, um, and actually we have had folks in the community to say, hey, can you check to see if this license plate's been in the area? Uh, we cannot do that unless we're investigating a specific, specific crime, and we have a case number that we can refer back to when we do our audits. So the good news in that explanation, and thank you, I thought that was a very helpful and clear explanation, is that it means that Supervisor Ellenberg can't go and find out where I've been, and I can't go and find out where Supervisor Ellenberg has been, so that, that affords us some privacy protection. But it also then means, I gather, that I can't find out what data the government, the sheriff's department, is holding on my lawful movements. Is that your understanding of the code section and how it applies? That's correct. Mr. Williams, is that your understanding of how the code section applies? 
Yes, and in part, it's just important to remember that um, under the Public Records Act, the purpose for the request being made and the type, the who the requester is are not relevant. And once a record is disclosed to anyone under the CPRA, it's disclosed to everyone who wishes to have that record. So you can't differentially apply it to somebody who might be seeking information about themselves versus uh, somebody else or versus creating their own database from that information. Does that mean that in your understanding that the only way this, I mean, I'm thinking of the Freedom of Information Act uh, requests that people make at the federal level to access information that the government has about them. Um, does that mean that the only way w we could see a change in uh, this uh, limitation, if you want to call it that, is through uh, legislative action that would clarify that individuals have a right to access about government-held data regarding their own movements? Yes, and there are provisions elsewhere that allow limited access to individuals who are affected by something or the other in other contexts. You know, we were talking uh, earlier today, for example, about people's health records. Obviously, that's information that we hold that the individual uh, has access to, but the public doesn't, and we don't provide that access pursuant to the Public Records Act because that would make it public as to the entire world. It's provided, of course, pursuant to those specific regulations and structure that allow the individual patient to access their own record. So you're absolutely right. There are many contexts where uh, an individual has a right of access distinct from the public generally. But making a Public Records Act request, that's not the case. Got it. I'll follow up with an off-agenda request uh, for an off-agenda memo, uh, Madam Chair, rather than pursue this further today. Um, I want to I want to close on a positive note, gentlemen. And that is to say, we've made a lot of progress on these issues over the years. Um, in uh, a little more than 10 years ago, when I was in my last year in the California State Legislature, I tried to get legislation passed that said that such ALPR information would not be held longer than six months, with exceptions. Uh, and it was the position of both private vendors and law enforcement, including the State Sheriff's Association, that the information could and should be held in perpetuity, meaning that a government database or even a commercial database could and would be compiled of the lawful movements of the citizenry that was held in perpetuity. And when I presented the legislation and got such strong pushback, um, you know, folks uh, in the I think it was the Senate Transportation Committee said, Mr. Simidian, are you prepared to compromise? And I made what I thought it was a matter of fact observation that others apparently found very amusing. I said, well, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between six months and forever we could find a middle ground. Um, but we couldn't. And we couldn't because, respectfully, folks in law enforcement and their commercial partners weren't prepared to do that. Now, to their credit, the California Highway Patrol had a much more balanced and, in my view, nuanced view of the matter. And here again in this county, we've been able to work with you all to get what I consider to be a reasonable retention period. There are, as Oakland points out, these legitimate concerns about privacy and due process and misuse of the information, misapplication of the technology. But done right, as I said earlier, I think you can keep folks safe, which I know is your mission, and still respect privacy and due process. And I think that 30-day number is one that, as Oakland points out, really does exceed the uh, sort of level of protection provided in most venues and most jurisdictions. So I'm gonna say thank you for that. And with all of, the, I am gonna exhort you to be mindful of the concerns that have been raised today, if and when we see you back with any proposals from the department about ALPR technology in the future. And um, Madam Chair, I'm guessing you're wondering if any of this is leading to a motion, and the answer is, I am prepared to move the recommended action on item 22, which is A, B, and C, which is to receive, receive, and adopt. Second. Second, thank you. Do you have additional comments, Supervisor Chavez? No. No. Um, thank you. I have, I have just two <laughs> relatively narrow um, 
issues to raise, which may only go into effect if and when you bring back another um, use policy, uh, another um, opportunity for, for this license plate used to be, reader to be used, sorry. Um, so the first, th these are, this is with regard to the mobile automated license plate reader. Uh, OCLEM noted that the surveillance use policy allows for data to be shared with agencies which could be shared with ICE and that there are two enumerated cases which could be interpreted as catch-all, um, which, which would allow virtually unlimited use. And again, I know that we have only one reader. It's not in service right now. We don't have current plans. Uh, to resume or expand, um, but the Los Altos Hills and Saratoga, and I'm, I'm sure Supervisor Smitty, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I believe eliminated those two um, catch-all provisions so that they kept their own uses narrow. That's an accurate assessment of the policies they ultimately adopted? That's correct. So if you are to represent something to to this board for approval, uh, I would expect that that our our own use policies are similarly narrowed, and I would ask um, the maker of the motion and the seconder if that piece can be incorporated first. I would um, incorporate it in the motion as a request of the sheriff's department uh, because I don't believe we're in a position to direct the sheriff what he and his department would submit. Excellent. But Thank I you. would share your uh, concern that if there is a proposal in future, it have the same uh, level of um, application and, and or limits on application. And um, your recollection is entirely correct, Madam President, not that you need me to verify them, but I remember it because that was not in the initial document and I called it out as something I hoped that the town and the Sheriff's Department could, towns, city and towns could agree to uh, along with the Sheriff's Department and we were able to get to yes on that and I right. think it's a better, thank you. Thank you. Uh, second, uh, regarding the hot lists for both stationary and mobile readers, uh, OCLEM reported that um, those hot lists, which for those who don't know are databases of vehicles of interest involved in investigations, should be regularly audited and updated. Plates no longer of interest should be removed to avoid unjustified stops and potential disparate impact in cases where vehicles included on the hot list for low level offenses are leading to over policing um, of particular communities. We need to be tracking that data. I'm, I'm imagining an unfortunate but but very possible scenario if um, proper precautions aren't taken in which someone is incorrectly identified in an investigation and is repeatedly pulled over because they're not removed from the hot list. And, and of course, and again, we know from all of the racially disproportionate impacts in our community, that's likely to become yet another one. Uh, I would be interested to see this audit come back with next year's annual surveillance report. Um, so if, if that can also be uh, added, Supervisor Samidi, in a request for an audit to be, to be paired with the next annual surveillance report for automated license plate readers. I would appreciate it. Happy to incorporate that request uh, in the motion. Thank you. Second. Great, that's all I have. Any other comments or, yes, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. I just have one quick question. Uh, on, in the packet uh, on the uh, number of lost and stolen plates on the two reports, the numbers are totally off. Uh, one says during that period of time uh, from September 21 to June 22, they, they got the uh, Los Altos Hills have 757 lost and stolen plates among, of course, there's 19 stolen vehicles and three felony vehicles. And then another report that I read um, in, in um, uh, what that Saratoga has, has only 11 loss of stolen plates. So is it true to say that, um, I mean, I can't imagine all the stolen cars ends up in Los Altos and not, not in Saratoga. I'm just trying to see why the numbers are so, so different in one jurisdiction versus the other. Yes, yeah, yeah, Supervisor. So those are two separate reports? Right, correct. Right? Yeah. So one is for the city of Saratoga and during that time frame, which again was a couple of months only. 
Um, that's correct, there were 11. And then for the town of Los Altos Hills, uh, we had it for six months, and that was a little higher of a number, 757. Could also be something with the number of ALPR cameras in, in the city and the town. Uh, Saratoga has significantly less ALPRs than the town of Los Altos Hills. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, my staff is, advises me that I perhaps wasn't as clear as I intended to be um, on the request regarding um, future uses. And, and what I had intended to ask for is a request that the surveillance use policy be amended um, to address those two catch-all provisions rather than waiting for another item to, to be brought forward. Again, a request. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I'm happy to incorporate what I believe is uh, a request from you that the existing surveillance use policy for the existing single unit reflect the same limitations that the Los Altos Hills and Saratoga policies do with respect to the two items that were identified in the OCLEM report. My team would be much more pleased with you than with me right now. No. That, that, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We do have one virtual hand raised, Madam Chair, but that individual spoke on the surveillance items during consideration of the consent calendar, so we won't be able to take that person's comments, and we have no other hands raised. Thank you. Let's take a vote. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is item 23, which is the Employee Services Agency Surveillance Use Policy. Uh, good afternoon, President Ellenberg and members of the board. John Mills, Employee Services Agency Director. Um, the item before you is a request from the Employee Services Agency to be able to acquire a digital camera and camcorder to be able to have um, content for our recruitment efforts on both our recruitment web pages and our social media sites and also to be able to um, create videos that um, describe workplace scenarios and what it's like to work for the county and also to have some scenario-based trainings for our training unit. Um, and with that, I'm available to respond to any questions that you may have. Thanks, John. I had requested that this item uh, be held because I had some questions that I, I wanted to ask of the employees who could be directly impacted um, by, by this use in the presence of the cameras, and my questions have been answered, so I am satisfied now. Does do any of my colleagues have questions? If not, I will move approval of the item. Second. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? We have no public speakers, Madam Chair. Thank you. Let's take a vote. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4-0. Thank you. Item 24 is next, and I believe that um, requires a Levine Act announcement. Item number 24 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page 3 of the agenda. And Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to indicate at this time that we have been advised that item 24 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. And we have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must, must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. So I wanna ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of the county staff or any member of the public 
knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other presentation on this? Or are we moving directly to a motion? Let's do, let's do that. Give a little bit of preview, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board. Gene Clark, Chief Procurement Officer. To my right is Kathleen and Nick from Labor Relations. We're putting before you for consideration an item to have the janitorial services approved. This was held on November 1st. Two of those items were approved at that time. There's six remaining to approve uh, this afternoon per, per your, or for your consideration. Um, it's for a three-year agreement with one two-year option. I know that uh, Labor Relations has had some uh, discussions with SCIU on this matter. Uh, they're here for, uh, to answer questions, but I think I'll, I'll pause there right now to uh, see if we can uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. I just, we don't have public speakers on this item. I'm asking. Do we have public speakers on We do item? have one speaker in the virtual queue. Okay, you would like to hear the speaker first? Let's give another second and just let me remind folks that are on Zoom, if you'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand now. When the first speaker begins, we'll close the queue for meeting management purposes. We have no additional hands, just the one speaker. All right, let's hear the one speaker for two minutes, please. Okay, next speaker is Joel Verana. Joel, you're being unmuted. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Joel Verana, and I'm the Vice Chair representing Blue Collar Workers for SEIU 521. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a representative of Blue Collar Workers, I am concerned in regards to the contracted janitorial work as referenced in this agenda item. SEIU is currently engaged, as was referenced uh, earlier, in the process to create jobs within the county that will help al alleviate the need for these agreements by having our own workers complete these very important tasks while saving the county some money at the same time. We have been in contact with the county as recently as this morning regarding this matter. It is my belief that both SEIU and the county are in agreement, believe it or not, that these jobs should come in house. With that being said, SEIU is not comfortable with the length of the terms of these agreements as seen in the agenda today. It is our intention to bring these agreements back to the board, if possible, for consideration for a reduction from a three-year term to a two-year term the county has indicated they also would support this if possible. The logic behind this is that making these jobs is making these jobs a reality is important work and we will prioritize the completion of it and will not need five years to do this. I'd like to thank you for your consideration and time regarding these matters. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much. Supervisor Travis. Thank you. So I just want to confirm that, that the, you all are comfortable with the two-year term for these contracts? Uh, this is Gene again. I, I must say I, I do have some concerns about that because the request for proposal that was put out uh, and the subsequent uh, contracts that were signed by the uh, providers to uh, janitorial firms have signed for three years. So that in relation to the proposal itself, uh, given the fact that we would reduce it by one year, would um, prompt me to go back and investigate that situation uh, in parity, uh, because they in good faith put the proposal forward for consideration and those two uh, proposals were accepted uh, and those, those uh, presidents signed off. So the best I can say there is I, I could go back and review that. Could I commit to two year today after they've signed without talking to them? That would be very difficult for me to do. Maybe I can jump in here. I think, uh, you know, we all agree that it would be best to have this work done in house. Um, you know, we have about countywide about 427 
janitor positions and only 22 of those are vacant. So that's an extremely low vacancy rate of 5%. And the jobs are pretty much snatched up as quickly as they can be created. The median day of being vacant when they are vacant is a medium day count of 94. So um, we don't really have trouble finding the positions or finding the incumbents. What we have trouble with is um, getting the positions and paying for them. So I would suggest that the board consider approving the contracts as they are, realizing that if we don't need them for more than two years, we don't have to use them. There's nothing that requires us to use them even where they are now. So um, it's a, the recommendation from staff would be that we take a two prong approach. We definitely need help right now. We also need uh, employees. We can do both at the same time. So just so I understand the contract structure, so this is a not to exceed three years? Correct. Then why would there be, I mean, why would there be a challenge with a two-year deadline? I mean, well, I'm, I'm really just trying to understand that from a, if, if what you're sure. saying is because the sure. contracts were signed, right. if the contracts were signed with a not to exceed, then that would <laughs> sound like it means you could end the contract and or use any number of hours within the contract that, you're, that are necessary. Is yeah. there a minimum? Uh, well, not, not necessarily a minimum, but what could be asserted is for the three-year term, they put particular costs in for the three-year term, and now it's going to be reduced to two-year term. So to, to say unilaterally today that we want to go to a two-year term would minimally just mean we'd want to go back and have that discussion with them. Gene, I may not be asking the question properly, and I'm just trying to it. understand what Dr. Smith is saying. Yeah. It just and I means don't have the contract we, in front of me. It just means they've signed the contract. If we want to change it, we have to go back and renegotiate it. Correct. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to ask the question a different way just to make sure I understand it. So the contract is is this like a a JOC like where you have a, a minimum number of hours or a maximum number of hours? No. No. So what did we buy? We're buying services for a period of up to three years as we need those services. A period up to three years as we need those services. Mm -hmm. So if we don't need them tomorrow, we don't use them. But okay. we know well, that we're going to. Uh, we know that we're going to need them to some extent. I, I, we've had a couple of conversations. Excuse the interruption through the chair, and I'm, I'm looking at my colleague to make sure it's all right. I, I think. What I'm hearing Supervisor Chavez say is, if we approve these, could we simultaneously direct you to go fill them with county staff people sometime prior to two years from now? Uh, and I think your answer to that is yes. Absolutely, and we could amend it, yes. Well, I'm not asking for an amendment. Not, not the contract. What right. I'm hearing you say is, could we just say, you've got a contract that you're telling us we don't have to live with for three years, right? Yes. Period. I just want to make sure that that's, yes. And yes, if we don't have true. to live with it for three years, we could, as a board, direct you to go find some codes and put some county employees in those codes, at which point we would not need the services. And as Dr. Smith said a minute ago, because we wouldn't need the services, we could say, thank you, it's been a lovely two years, and no longer use the services of the people we're contracting with. Yes, we could. Okay. Yeah, but let me make one correction. Don't ask Gene to find the positions because he doesn't do that. That was the royal you. <laughs> that was the royal yeah. you. No, I just I wanted Please. to understand the implications of what you were saying, and I, I now do. Thank you for the translation, Supervisor Sumidian. So then what I what I would like to do is um, is do two things at once, which is move the acceptance of these contracts and to ask staff to come back to the board with into the full board because this has been batted around and I, I you know we just need to anyway to the full board with a plan for recruitment for these positions and I have not yet seen but would like to an assessment of the total need in addition to well period that would be my motion I'll second 
Thank you. I actually have a question, to Steph. Please go right ahead. I hate to, I hate to, nope, to, to keep beating the, so if I understand Gene the contract correctly, mm -hmm. going back to old contract law, in this case, this contract says that the contractor are obligated to provide service of all three years based on this contract. However, us being the, the uh, other side of the county, we have the option to not use those services any time we wish during those three years period. Is that yeah, correct? There, there's a, yes, there's a period of, of staff that you have, and that does fluctuate. It doesn't materially affect the contract that you would have to uh, terminate it. There, there are those sways and swings that happen in the course of business. So that on that account, you're right. We're on solid ground. So just as an example, let's say in three months, somehow we fill 50% of those positions because we could find those folks to do the work. Yes. We could actually tell the contractor, thank you very much for those last three months. We only need 50% of you from now on. And then, let's say, if they're more coming on board, we could continue reducing. I mean, I don't think these numbers will yeah, suddenly yeah. grow to zero, but I think it might be a gradual drop potentially it's through a three-year period. And that's, according to this contract, is perfectly acceptable. It is, because there's no guaranteed maximum. Now, Great. to my partners to the right, how we get those, and Dr. Smith's comment, those are my experts over here, how that would be worked out in the hiring of them, et cetera. Right. But the contract... Your that's what are, the contract yes. states, right? Yes, that's what does. we're voting on, of course, as yes. a contract. Yes, it is. How that's being done is you guys. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion, a second. We've heard public comment. I see Dr. Smith's light on. Yep. Dave, let's vote. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Thank you very much. Item 25 is being held until April 4th. We um, addressed item 26 along with item 10, which brings us to item 27, another Levine Act item on Educator Workforce Housing Project. Item number 27 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And Madam Chair, if I may. You may. We have been advised that item 27 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings as defined by the Levine Act has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much. And with that being said, <coughs> I am happy to move approval of the recommended action with a shout out and a thank you to staff. Uh, co colleagues will be uh, pleased to note that in order to reduce the total measure A participation in this project, um, we are using $4 million from the Stanford Affordable Housing Fund. And I can't resist the opportunity to say in support of the motion that this is why it's important that folks who develop in the community address the housing impacts of their development because it does in fact create a demand and absent meeting that demand, um, we need fees. And in this case, the fees have been paid and are available to create exactly the kind of workforce housing that we were talking about, believe it or not, more than 20 years ago. Mm. That's my motion. Second. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about this. I'm gonna support it. It's more just to make sure I understand this. So we're increasing the Measure A contribution uh, to this, and, and I'm just wondering what, um, what pot of the Measure A um, 
fund does this come out of? And then second is, is are we actually expecting a loan repayment or no? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for the question. The funding for Measure A, or the $6 million, is coming from the what we refer to as mixed income bucket. It's $100 million. There's currently $63 million available for allocation to developments just like this. If you recall, there was an interest in having and funding projects that were in proximity to public transit. Um, and so that's where the funding is coming from. And it is structured differently than our you know, traditional soft loans where we get paid over time. In this case, we will be receiving a priority payment of cash flow. So for, we will be paid back our six million within 15 years. And that money um, for our purposes and more just for future um, boards, when we loan uh, money out of a particular fund, whichever section it is, that money then would be recycled back to be able to address that particular need. Is that accurate? Historically, that is the way that our recommendations have come forward to the board, is that we would fund the original source or the original program. So it would presumably go back to the mixed income bucket. Got it. Um, but the board is, uh, because it's a loan repayment, it's not required to go in that bucket. I, I only raise that not because I have an opinion about it today, but what I one thing I would want my colleagues to give some thought to more from a future perspective, because at some point, we're going to start getting payments back, and it, I, I don't think it'll ever be right. <laughs> I don't think it'll ever be um, robust, but I would like future boards to have the flexibility to respond to need. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important to understand um, where the money comes from, what type of housing allows for that, so that you all can make decisions in the future about the best way to um, allocate those funds. So that's really helpful, Consuelo. Thank you. And then I only had one last uh, question. Um, this uh, this project, if I'm remembering this, uh, Joe, this was one of the. Um, uh, did was this one one of your projects that was on county land already? Okay, that's uh, that's what I thought. I just couldn't remember that. But anyway, good work. I, I always appreciate how very uh, flexible you are on how you fund things. And I do just want to make a plug to my colleagues that one of the biggest challenges that we have is really the state's. Um, tax credit process that is so, cumbersome. That it's cumbersome and it, it is so biased against counties like ours that it is hard to understand how we're still able to build housing, which is why I appreciate you, Consuelo, more than you could ever know because that's such a mess at a state level. So I'm really excited to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian? No, no more. All right. Do we have public speakers on this item? We have no public speakers on this item, Madam Chair. And I see no lights, so let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Item 28, Emergency Assistance Network uh, Homelessness Prevention Services and the Levine Act item. Item number 28 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And Madam Chair. Supervisor Smidian, do you have something to add? Yes, I do. We have been advised that item 28 on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We have been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the County Council's office or of the Clerk of the Board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I can promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much. So moved. M motion by Chavez, second by Lee. Do we have comments as well? Yes. Just one thing again. This is really the direction we want to go in in terms of prevention. And 
I know that as you are putting together charts, um, one thing I want to make sure we're, we're tracking is um, how much we're investing in prevention per family or per household over the long haul, because I think it will help both the public and, the, again, the board make decisions about resources. I know you've, you've done some snapshot work on that, um, but just to encourage that we do that with your, whenever you're doing your annual reports uh, or whatever report you're doing that, are they annual, Consuelo, or are they quarterly? The heading home is done quarterly. But the overall, well, so for heading home, let's make sure, make this part of the reporting, but I, I do just want to encourage us to use the experience we have on our annual report so we can explain that to the public as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian. Supervisor Lee. Yes, yeah, just want to um, have a call out, a shout out of these uh, EAN, we call EAN the, the uh, Emergency Action Network uh, Partners, that is so, uh, Emergency Assistance Network Partners, that is so important for our county in terms of uh, homelessness prevention services. In this case, we're trying to use the opera funds, but obviously they do way, way more uh, than what this budget has been uh, added. So what we're adding here is the amended budget, frankly, is a very small portion of what they are doing. And I just want to read out their names. I mean, most of you know who they are, but can we New Services Agency, Life Moves, Sacred Heart Community Service, Salvation Army, St. Joseph Family Center, Sunnyvale Community Services, West Valley Community Services. Thank you for your hard work in this very difficult times. And this funding will allow these agencies to increase the capacity from 210 to 365. And that's uh, truly, uh, really life savings uh, work that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? We have no public speakers on this item, Madam Chair. All right, I just want to add my appreciation to Consuelo. The work just continues to, to boggle. Um, let's vote. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Thank you, that carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Item 29 was handled on consent. Item 30, uh, elected officials on leave when charged with misconduct. This was originally a referral from Supervisor Lee, and we are receiving a report from County Council. Do you want to address um, or ask any questions or make a motion to receive and approve the report? So I would first want to uh, say thank you to our County Councils uh, for the detailed analysis for their work on uh, this, uh, uh, this item. Uh, my, I, I would just like to move to receive report and direct administration uh, to work with a county council to work with our legislature uh, on what options there is to amend the state laws they have proposed, similar to what was done for item number 72 uh, with Senator Aisha Wahab's uh, way. So basically, we're, we're saying, yeah, I just leave the motion alone. And any questions, I could talk more about it. If county council might have any uh, additional amendment to this. No, just available to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Comments, questions? Question? Go right ahead. So, um, Supervisor Lee, just to be clear, um, County Council's memo back to us, or uh, ledge file back to us, sort of has an option one and option two, and did you essentially offer a direction that they should just work with the legislator and come back and tell us if there's something worthy of support in the future once we know what it is. I think you, you, you nailed it right there, Supervisor yeah. Sumidian. There, there, there's, uh, uh, there's just so many uh, moving parts, and since the, legisl the legislature is already taking on this item, uh, I think it's good to see what comes out the, up there, and then we can then, of course, take a position yeah. of what is support or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Madam President, just in part, so staff and the public, to the extent that folks are engaged on this topic, have a sense of where uh, different board members are. I, <clears throat> I thought that um, staff's recommendation of what I'll call option one, the first bulleted point, was uh, well advised, well considered, and uh, I just tossed that out there. I think, um, you know, Supervisor Lee's initial referral uh, prompted me to give, you know, additional thought to how do we struggle through. Uh, the situation you know that we had recently, uh, where you've got someone who has been <sighs> charged with willful or corrupt misconduct in office by a supermajority of the civil grand jury, and the district attorneys made their judgment that there's a basis to pursue. 
uh, and there's a legal uh, sufficiency determination, and yet you're then sort of stuck trying to make that work for months and months and months thereafter. So I, I appreciate the referral. Um, I thought it was a, an intriguing question about whether or not a person who might be suspended if the law permitted it could, should be continue to receiving pay. And I went through my, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, myself back and forth several times and actually had a robust discussion with the staff in my office just because I thought it was an intriguing issue. Um, and, you know, at one level I, I was uh, kind of think, well, we're probably on a more sound footing in terms of legality and liability if salary continues to be paid. Although if there was state legislation, presumably that would no longer be an issue. That being said, as much as I, you know, it would gall the hell out of me, quite frankly, uh, to keep paying somebody who uh, was um, willfully or uh, corrupt. Uh, and I'm sure the public's not going to be happy about it if that's the, the eventual path we take. I do think, uh, you know, until and unless someone has been convicted, um, and as long as the bird, you know, the as long as the presumption of innocence is, attaches, uh, I think the equities probably fall on the side of continuing to pay the salary, as galling as that would be uh, to many of us. So I, I thought your sort of uh, option one was probably the better course, but to Supervisor Lee's point, um, I think this is going to be a, a long running saga uh, in the legislature and we will see what the next chapter holds, but I support the motion and thank him again for bringing it to us. Thank you very much. Did I ask already for public comment on this item? Uh, you did not, but we don't have any speakers. Excellent. Thank you. James. I was just going to say that I, you know, I think there are a variety of options available. Um, my own recommendation is that first option because I think it does thread the needle between providing appropriate due process protections, going well through the process, uh, but really also hitting a point in time where, uh, frankly, the official would really be challenged to continue to exercise their obligations in office at the time when they're also dealing with preparing for and carrying out a trial. So uh, we'll certainly look at what's going on legislatively and we'll keep the board updated with any developments uh, on that front uh, and uh, keep our eye out for what else uh, may happen uh, in Sacramento. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I thank you, uh, Supervisor Median, and so thank you, uh, County Council, for those uh, input. I'm, I'm, com I'm in complete agreement with what you just said regarding option one. I think that's great. And again, thanks so much for County Council's office for the hard work on this. Uh, just to uh, answer the question from Supervisor Median regarding the pay issue, yeah, that's a tough one because of the fact of conviction and all that. So I think my, my concern on this referral really is trying to make sure that an individual who has been accused and been you know, bothered by all these other trials and whatnot, that has the ability to focus on that case so that the county's work that needs to be done is being handled by somebody else that could have the focus and dedication to do the job. So that's really what it's about. The pay in, a, in all scheme of things, you know, as much as this, this tasteful it sounded like, it, it's, a, it's another constitutional hurdle that I don't want to mess with at this point. But again, the legislature might figure it out how that works and we'll let that, that happen. But in the meantime, that's, that's my motion and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a vote, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries 4 0. Thank you very much. Item 31 is held to April 4th, so we're now looking at items removed from the consent calendar. And Dave, I have items 49, 84, and 96 to consider. Is that your understanding as well? That's what I have as well, yes. Excellent. Then let's begin with item 49. So I'll uh, start it off here. Um, the board asked for some more information about psychiatrists. Um, Dave, can you let me share, please? Certainly. And if I can just interrupt really quickly, I, this is a Living Act item. So I need to read the, the statement yes, first. Please do. 
Item number 49 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. And Madam Supervisor Chair, I read, I read my uh, Levine Act uh, uh, prose uh, earlier when this item was on the uh, consent calendar, I believe, so I'll just forego it again. Excellent, <laughs> thank you. Dr. Smith. So <clears throat> I think the, one of the first questions was how many psychiatrist positions do we have and how many are vacant? I put up on the um, display um, all of our positions. Currently we've got 73 positions, uh, 23 are vacant. That's a pretty high percentage rate. You can see looking at the table where they're assigned currently. Um, these are um, filled positions where they say behavioral health services. That means they're actually working in a behavioral health clinic. This is by cost center, so you can tell where they are assigned. Where it says medical staff, that means that they're working through VMC and can be assigned to multiple locations, including VMC clinics, EPS, BAP, uh, or consultation. Obviously, there's one there for VHHP, which is the homeless program. We have a number for BAP assigned specifically for BAP. That's our inpatient psychiatric facility. And a number assigned specifically for EPS. And then urgent care in custody, and then the AB 109 um, ones are just paid through AB 109, but they're assigned through to custody. Then to go to the vacant positions, um, I won't go through them in detail, but you can see that they're spread generally across the same list of uh, positions. Um, the um, Issues with vacancies and attracting psychiatrists are significant. As I mentioned, we have 73 positions with 23 vacancies. That's a very high vacancy rate of about 31 and a half percent. And the median days of vacancy, so when a vacancy occurs, the medium days required to recruit someone is 306 days. That really means there's very few psychiatrists who are interested in working in the public sector, and that has to do with the fact that they can make considerably more money for a lot less stress and strain seeing people in a private office. Um, we have <clears throat> also been asked by the board to give um, information about how we utilize the contract physicians because of this vacancy rate and because of the difficulty in attracting applicants, we use the contract physicians where their highest priority needs are. So that's, you know, contracts, I mean, custody health, um, uh, EPS, BAP, and uh, urgent care. And they're assigned based on their availability in those areas. There was the discussion about um, current higher rates, I obviously already talked about that. Um, workforce strategies to improve our, re our recruitment and retention are um, the recognition that this is a nationwide problem. Um, as I mentioned, psychiatrists have a much easier life in the public and the private sector and we also know that um, there are certain public sector environments where they prefer to be where there's outpatient clinics, numerous outpatient clinics. Um, I should point out that our contract for UAPD, who represents our psychiatrists, come, opens up in uh, October of 23, and so part of our strategy with them will be to see if we can come up with more ways to attract more uh, psychiatrists. 
Um, I don't know if you have anything else to say, Darren. I think you said you don't, but could you turn your okay. mic on, please? So, um, <coughs> bottom line, I think, is that we're sort of forced into a position where we have high acuity patients in um, custody and BAP and in EPS where we need to have 24-hour uh, coverage and we have great uh, difficulty with getting a psychiatrist interested in working in the public sector. We're stuck with utilizing uh, locums groups and this issue or this item on the agenda is to approve contracts which we again don't have to use if we don't need them, but I really honestly don't see a future where we can attract um, psychiatrists away from the public sector. And you also know, the board knows very well, the same problem is occurring with our partners in the community-based organizations who have extreme difficulty attracting psychiatrists also. So How are we questions. able to contract with psychiatrists? What does the contract payment look like versus what we would offer um, as employees? Well, the different agencies have different reimbursement structures, but the summation is that they pay um, with a flat fee without um, all of the benefits associated. You know, our current top um, salary right now for Psychiatrist is a little less than um, 400,000. Um, I mean, sorry, 300,000. Um, you add in our benefit package, that's another 25%. So essentially what happens is the locum agencies are able to attract people to work uh, for a higher salary without benefits. And we don't really have that option. That's interesting, though, but that might be, as we're talking about, you know, actual strategies. I, I understand and I hear you that, that there's a nationwide shortage, but that's, of course, not a hiring strategy. Who, who thinks about that? Is that an executive office? Is that an ESA? Is that done in conjunction with our physicians groups? Do we have any paths forward to actually recruit and solve for this? Um, such a critical role for a county with a health system the size that we have in a prioritization of mental health. The executive office of the department um, works with ESA to try to come up with advertising and specific recruitment tools, but um, realistic, I don't want to get too far into this, but realistically we're going to have to talk about this seriously in October when the UAPD contract reopens to see if there's other things that we can offer. You know, we can't necessarily outbid the private sector monetarily, but there are also other, quote, non-monetary things that could be built into the contract that might make the job more attractive. Things like, you know, off time or um, particular schedules or flexible schedules or other things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, in the private sector, working in your own private office, you can easily bring down 500K. Um, hard to compete with that in a private sector world, in a public sector world. But in your own private office, you only make money when you work. Also, <laughs> in, in your private office, you're only making money during the times that you're seeing patients as opposed to being on a a, a salary, but thank you, I, I, I understand the point. I just want to kind of drill in a little bit more so, so I understand. Is the shortage historical or is this something that's more recent? There's always been a challenge with um, graduates um, going from medical school going into psychiatry and the number of residencies has dropped and the number of spaces available in those residencies has dropped. Um, so 
it started years ago, but it's now become critical because the needs have expanded at the same time that the trained cohort is decreasing based, I mean, you know, it takes seven to eight years to get trained, as you well know. Mm -hmm. um, so the people who decided not to go into psychiatry now have left a smaller group behind to now deal with a growing need. Thanks. I, so it's I a little like the, the primary care issue, too. And mm -hmm. I mean, we could go into the issues of medical school, which you it's don't want to do. <laughs> but thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your answering my questions, so there's nothing further that I need to ask, and I'm prepared to move approval of the contract. And I'll second it. I, I just have a follow-up question. Go right ahead. Um, thank you very much for that exchange. That was really helpful. And I, I've wondered, is the, is the psychiatric field, um, when we look at the, the um, medical practices that get attached to a healthcare institution, you know, like for us where we have doctors that are that aren't employees but they practice at our hospitals do psychiatrists do something similar do they have similar um, economic structures um, they can uh, we have an open medical staff so um, any doctor who qualifies can work in our hospitals without being an employee they do their own billing at that point same is true with psychiatrists. But nowadays, most psychiatrists spend their time in their office and clinics, and they do not usually focus on the severely and permanently mentally ill, which is a big part of our population, the really severely troubled that are very unresponsive to treatment. They usually focus on mild to moderate um, care. Um, I don't know if that answers your it question. It really does. I mean, it, it answers a, a different challenge. I think it goes back to what um, President Ellenberg was asking about in terms of the recruitment strategy, because we are also, we're not just competing against other institutions, we're also competing against other institutions which um, with a much harder to serve clientele. Yep. And. Um, and I, I know that is true in some ways for a lot of our practices, but I think as it relates to this, it's even more intensive. And so, um, so one just recommend, request or recommendation I'd be interested in understanding prior to us getting into um, contract negotiations would be um, to, to take a look if there are any national surveys around how psychiatrists are choosing where and when they want to work in certain environments because I think the point you raise is an excellent one about what do what does the public sector have to offer outside of you know just you know cash payments that would make it appealing and I think one point that that Susan raised about you know conditions for an office so when I think some of the investments you're making in the newer facilities helps because I think that is something that people look at is the environment they're going to be working in. Um, but I'm wondering if there, there are others in terms of, you know, how um, calendars get structured. And then, frankly, the ability for folks to continue to do private practice, um, at least that's been my experience that almost everybody that we deal with has a private practice as well. So I know it's more com complex, but I think it would be worth everybody here understanding prior to the fall. Right. But thank you, that was very helpful. That's an interesting thing, too, in terms of maybe cobbling together more part-time doctors who, who aren't quite as enmeshed. And do we have a psychiatry residency rotation here? We do not have a psychiatry residency. People do rotate from, I think, Stanford from time to time, but not consistently. The Too big thing, a question for now, but I'd be curious to know because maybe that's a way if we grow yeah. our own. And particularly with the new facility. Yeah. Greta? I was just going to um, mention offhandedly there's a um, wonderful leader who um, we've had some discussions with um, at Stanford who teaches as part of the psychiatry residency program who's commented many, many times that he is always encouraging 
those in psychiatry residency to really think about where the need is for their professional skill set to really focus on treating the seriously mentally ill rather than the um, fact that the overwhelming majority of um, psychiatrists end up treating what he's called the worried well and, and how um, deep the need is for folks who are willing to work in county service serving definitely the more difficult to treat, but certainly much more in need of treatment population that the county system of care focuses on. And I think that has been a push um, at Stanford to try and encourage their graduates to go um, into serving our type of high need population, but definitely something that I think all psychiatry residency programs really need to focus on given that as we've seen the demand for mental health care really increase amongst folks who don't suffer from serious mental illness but are looking for counseling and other services, including from trained psychiatrists at times, that we're seeing you know, a, a depleted pool of resources to treat folks with serious mental illness. And that's obviously very challenging for our system, but also for all systems that treat the kind of high need patients that we serve. Thank you. You should Do also just throw in there for complexity there are psychiatric social work, I mean, uh, nurse practitioners, which is also an option. Um, um, it would be a challenging uh, labor option for us, but it's possible. Thank you. It sounds like there's a lot to, yes. Just to follow up on that, mm -hmm. do you mean um, nurse practitioners the same way we have them in a medical, in a we have psych nurses now. Well, I was going to well, Those ask are just psych clinical nurses. Oh, I'm talking okay. about nurse practitioners that have a, psychiatric. That a special psychiatric training. So they function as a physician extender in the sense that they do need some supervision from a psychiatrist and some compliance with protocols. But other than that, they can provide care on their own. And are those, are, do any of our schools locally train that particular class classification of employee or worker? The closest I'm aware of is down in LA. Um, but I, I mean, that's a possibility to look into. It's a really interesting possibility because San Jose State now has an, an NP program. I think it's a doctorate program now that they have. So. When we have our meeting with them, let's put this on the table. Thank you. That's, That's really why helpful. I didn't bring that up. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to move us, for chance, to the next item. Uh, yeah, just just on the question, the, the nurse practitioner, um, just having data one a long time ago, so know a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> UCSF apparently has a, one of the you best nurse practitioner program. <laughs> And I so I guess if that's the, uh, the Dr. Smith, when you mentioned that, that's the only program you see know is in LA. I guess Prairie is, is, is why we won't have one in UCSF, for example, um, or other, other institutions up here in Northern California that seems to be a, a huge missing given how, what the gap is right now on, on the issue of psychiatry. So I just, just prop, prop that question. Is this something that we can engage and talk to our local uh, uh, nursing programs to see if there's something right. that we could offer opportunity for them to, to do the type of training that this, no, we have, we have the needs. So it's, it's perfect, right? Thank you. I always appreciate the, the deep engagement of, of everyone on this board. Uh, let's vote on this item. And just for the record, we have no speakers on this item as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Night item 84. We are up to now. And that is to adopt a resolution ratifying the March 8, 2023 proclamation of local emergency by the Director of Emergency Services relating to winter rain and snowstorm conditions. I'm going to assume there are questions on this item since we didn't approve it on consent. So let's go right to questions, please. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I, my understanding from my office is that Mr. Reed can't be with us because he's actually off dealing with some of these very emergencies. So um, let me just uh, offer up a couple of questions and see if our team here can um, step in. Uh, in his absence. So um, 
I'm thinking of the snow, the March 1st snowstorm. I don't usually get to say snowstorm very often, so uh, the March 1st snowstorm. Uh, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm trying to get a better handle on how the declaration of local emergency and the governor declaring a state of emergency uh, actually or potentially help uh, our county and residents who are impacted by the storm. And, um, you know, again, with reference to the March 1st events, the snowstorm, how does our county determine impacts to county facilities and, you know, including uh, roads? Uh, and a private property, which is an issue I've raised a couple times now, uh, including homes and privately maintained roads, which are not uncommon in the area. So as I understand, the f those are kind of two questions as I understand it. So the fir first question is kind of why would we proclaim a uh, local emergency uh, in this kind of scenario? And uh, there are a lot of different reasons depending on the nature of the emergency and what needs to happen, but I think the biggest reason for this type of event is in order to be able to potentially access state and federal funding, um, and there's different categories of that funding, as the board well knows from the conversation associated with the January events where the county was approved for public assistance FEMA funding um, through the federal government, which does provide reimbursement for um, damage to public facilities such as public roads, but the county was not approved for individual assistance funding for private property, and that's what we're in the process of appealing, as the board will call from the conversation at our last meeting. Uh, similarly here, the governor did move forward with a proclamation of a, of a state of emergency, including uh, our county, and so our local um, measure is uh, operates in conjunction with that and uh, will potentially allow us to take advantage of the California Disaster Assistance Act for potential funding uh, associated with the response activities as well as with um, any repairs um, probably in this case really focused on public infrastructure I think it's less likely uh, but you know, I'll have to see what the numbers are, but less likely that in this case there would be uh, individual assistance. Uh, but that's the main reason for this particular emergency. There's lots of other reasons why it, it may make sense, including, um, you know, depending on the nature of the event, the need to impose extraordinary emergency measures or orders. That's not the, really the case for this type of event, but there's many other reasons why. Um, but, the, but it's really the funding piece, I think, that's the primary one for this type of event. In terms of how that determination is made uh, in, in, qualifi in qualifying, which I think is kind of your second question, how do we figure out what, what has happened, uh, there's a couple different things that occur. With respect to the county as a whole geographically, we serve as the operational area and so collect from each of the local jurisdictions any damage assessments, both on the uh, individual private side, but, but primarily for this type of event, again, on the public side, damage to public infrastructure. We collect that together and then forward it on to the California Office of Emergency Services, which um, processes that at the state level and passes that on to FEMA. Um, for unincorporated areas of the county, uh, we're primarily responsible for directly gathering that information and not working through a city because obviously there's no city. Uh, and the County Office of Emergency Management does a variety of things to try to collect that information. For on the public um, infrastructure side, that's primarily going to be information from other county departments with respect to unincorporated counties, such as. Uh, the roads department with respect to whatever costs they incurred in trying to respond to the, the cleanup that was required or repair to emergency damage or other, thing, other such costs. Um, there may be other county departments involved in an emergency response, but for unincorporated areas, it's primarily gonna be information from other county departments that's gathered. On the individual um, assistance side, it's primarily through pushing out public-facing information to have folks share damage assessments and information, which OEM does do. 
in addition, uh, the areas that are significantly affected, for, for example, an area that's um, had slides or floods or, or other impacts are often directly visited by OEM staff and have a particular push of information to try to do an assessment in those locations. So those are kind of the two basic pieces um, to put that together. Um, and that's the process that's been used from the January event where we do have approved public assistance at the federal level. And like I said, we're appealing the um, denial of adding Santa Clara County on the individual assistance front. Through the, Supervisor. Through the, mm -hmm. through the chair, um, thanks. I, I want you, you anticipated my, my follow-up on the sort of December and January uh, storms where we declared an emergency and the state followed, as I understand the process and as you've described it. And, um, and the county is, again, as you're gonna get, has since received the public assistance declaration from FEMA, but not, just to be clear, but not the individual household assistance uh, and the Small Business Administration disaster program? That's correct. So do we know what the status of the governor's appeal of the FEMA February 24 denial of our request is? My understanding is that additional information has been submitted to the state and that the state has now passed that on and we're waiting to hear back on that. Okay, so my one word summary that I'm scribbling to myself is pending. Does that yes. sound right? Pending. All right. And, you know, colleagues, uh, and it seems obvious, but I, I'm not sure it's always sort of top of mind that the impacts here are often cumulative. Uh, you know that that you know any one of these would be a challenge, but you stack them up, one on top of another, on top of another. Um, so uh, you know we're in a we're in a, a place we haven't been before uh, recently, and, and because of the sort of one thing following another thing. Uh, is there, are there implications for what we should be doing on the communications front in terms of, you know, not thinking our work here is done on communications? The, I know the Office of Emergency Management is um, <coughs> doing real specific outreach in those areas that are facing the cumulative impact. You know, many of the same places, this is a little bit less so for the March 1 uh, event and more for, um, for example, the event of today coupled with the January events, but the, the flooding that tends to occur, and this has been true for many years, I can attest to that from uh, being in the EOC on prior flooding events many, many years ago, uh, tend to occur in the same places in our yeah. county. And so those are familiar locations and neighborhoods. Uh, and so the outreach is focused on those areas and the uh, impacts are, um, you know, not, not, of course, not identical, but they're within a realm of, of, of locations and areas that, that are uh, um, relatively known. So, so that's, that is a place where there's focus, right? Focused effort and outreach, where there's a direct visit to, to document and observe and record any damage that's occurred. Um, and to ensure that that information is passed on to the state as well and to FEMA. Uh, so that that is occurring, um, and uh, I know that OEM's focused on that. Um, so we're we're you know we can't predict. Forgive me, I'm. I'm stuck here, Madam President, because I'm trying to think what the future looks like and concluding that I can't know what the future looks like. So uh, are we going to revisit these issues at our meeting either on April the 4th or the 18th? I can't. <clears throat> we, we may end up, depending on how, what things look like, doing another proclamation associated with the most recent events, but 
we're definitely expecting successive storms continuing uh, for the next many weeks, and it may well continue for the next several months. Who knows? But um, but um, you're right that there would be cumulative impacts, and we would try to, um, as best as we can, try to link those incidents together in presenting a case to the state and federal government for assistance. But how they treat those is not entirely in our control. Yeah. Um. For example, I'll just say right now the presidential um, declaration is is as to the January events and and not further at this time. Yeah, I, I mean, Well, I, I, I want us to move expeditiously. On the other hand, I want us to, to really kind of wrestle some of these issues to the ground. So I'm going to I'm going to move that we adopt the resolution uh, as contained in item 84, but with a further declaration. Thank you, Supervisor. With a further uh, direction um, that we get a report back. Why don't I try it this way? no later than the April 18th Board of Supervisors meeting um, on at least three matters. My understanding is that the County Roads Department has a list of 14 uh, storm damaged road, county roads, county roads from the December, January storms. And so a sort of a status report on repairs on those 14 roads. Because um, these are in these rural areas, a lifeline for people. Um, also a comprehensive report on response to storm-related damage in the county since the December 2022 storms. That's a, that's a kind of an, uh, um, a request that, to make sure that we're both up to date and mindful of cumulative impacts in terms of the uh, damage going back what will then be you know, four months, frankly. Uh, and then um, on the roads matter, uh, as a result of the damage, there's a subset of the roadways, as I understand it, that have one-way stop controls, um, even though they serve as key evacuation routes for the areas. And, um, you know, it's a little hard to imagine right now, but, you know, wildfire season's gonna be on us uh, sooner than we think, and certainly sooner than we hope, and so I, I'm, going to ask that we get a uh, report on contingency planning to address the concern about evacuation routes uh, given one-way stop controls uh, and the timelines that are sometimes necessary to effectuate repairs. And then anything else you'd like to share. And I would also, if the seconder is amenable to all of that, ask to incorporate that in direction to the staff with a request that the, uh, with the direction that it come to us on our regular agenda and not be uh, on the consent calendar, because I think um, it requires some discussion. Uh, and rather than clog up the process with me asking for it to be removed from consent, we might as well just put it on the regular agenda at the front end. Is this something, Supervisor Sumidian, that you would be interested in sending to your committee first for that thorough no, discussion I, I, that you're I don't talking think about? We have, I don't think we have time. Um, I, I, I'm going to take what I think might be a subtle hint here. I, um, I, I don't think we have time to go through committee, but I will take the opportunity um, to schedule time with staff before the meeting so that I can have some back and forth. And if the staff can get us uh, a report prior to the packet coming out on the previous Wednesday, so much the better. Um, but I, I'm mindful of the need to do meeting management on your part, Madam President, and so I want to try and respect that as well. Much appreciated. Thank That's you. a wonderful idea. And I'm happy to incorporate all of that in my second, and and also just to maybe lift up that it would be good to have roads and airports and the appropriate staff present. And if, and if folks want to join us by Zoom, because they've got other other duties that are pressing, that's certainly understandable. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? We have no speakers on this item, Madam Chair. Let's vote on the uh, motion, please. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries 4-0. Thank you very much. I believe we have arrived at our final item, which is item 96. 
Good afternoon, Madam President, yeah. members of the board. My name is Lisa McKyle. I'm the Deputy Director for Planning in the Department of Planning and Development here at the county. I'm here to provide a response to a speaker's comment during the public comment in, um, for an item questioned uh, some of the units counted in our annual report. In preparing the annual reports by way of background, the department utilizes data to populate the information in the state mandated forms through its permitting system, which we refer to as Excella. In reviewing Table A, uh, which the public comments were provided, uh, the project on Old Calaveras, which was referred to as the remodel addition in livestock during public comment, includes a subdivision that was deemed complete in 2022 and would likely result in two to four new dwelling units and residences, uh, I'm sorry, ADUs and accessory dwelling units. The project that was previously reported in the 2021 annual report was accurately notated in 2021 as being deemed complete for processing. However, the applicant subsequently appealed that project, which was ultimately approved in 2022 and is why we see it again on this list. Uh, with respect to the speaker's third comment that had um, a question about an extension for a project that was double counted, the county staff did not find that particular notation. So pursuant to state law, the county is required to submit its annual report to the state's Department of Housing and Community Development, so HCD, every year by April 1st, and uh, this report is time sensitive. I'm happy to answer any questions of the board. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Thank you so much. Uh, so because of time sensitivity, so this is something that we need to uh, take action today, obviously. Uh, thank you for, for clarifying that, that question. So in terms of those uh, uh, changes as proposed by the speaker, uh, those were not necessary or those were incorrect? They were not necessary. They, they would be incorrect. We can make clarification on the second item to make sure that it's clear that that project was approved, right. but it should still be itemized and listed. Okay, but there's something you could do after this meeting to Correct. add to, to, to clarify, so that, that would be very helpful. Great, thank you. Now, um, as you know, this Thursday, we do have a uh, ABEC executive, uh, executive board meeting and on that uh, ABAC item number 10B on the agenda has to do with the updates concerning the sixth cycle of the uh, HCD, the housing elements draft uh, throughout our Bay Area jurisdiction regions and the discussion and information regarding this item is clearly relevant. Uh, I, I don't necessarily need it, any type of drawn explanation to my questions, but uh, more of a high level uh, uh, overview is, I know our county did not meet that January 31st deadline. Uh, would you be able to help uh, explain what, uh, how it happened and what can we expect a housing element draft to be submitted? Sure, so although this is not an item on the agenda, I can go ahead and give a brief background. We are attending the um, Hewlett Committee this coming Thursday where we'll have a report on the timelines for the housing element. The county is reviewing the um, housing element and we're about ready to submit it for public comment on March 21st. Okay. There will be a 30-day public comment period, followed by a 10-day 10, 10 required period of time that the county has to respond to comments. During that public comment period, we'll be attending the Hewlett Committee, the Planning Commission, our SIMPAC Committee, and we'll come back to the board um, on April 18th, and that would be appropriate time for the timeline to be exposed for everybody. Okay. That's helpful, yeah, thank you so much. That's all I need, like a very uh, high level one, and that's all I have now. Go ahead and move for approval on this. Thank you. I have a second. Are there comments or questions? Public speakers? We do have one virtual speaker. All right, that speaker uh, is welcome to join us for two minutes, please. Next speaker is John. John, you're being unmuted. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hello? Go ahead, John. Hi. Uh, the report, and it looks like... Hello? Hello? Go ahead, John. We can hear you. John, can you hear us? We may have lost the connection. I can hear you. We're still here. If you can hear us, please begin. I think something is not connecting, Dave, so. Yeah, he was our only speaker. Okay, well, I'm sorry that we didn't have an opportunity to hear from him, but um, 
On the other hand, I am adjourning our meeting at 320. I'm calling for a vote. Um, did we get a motion and a second on that item, Madam Chair? Thank you. I apologize. I, I apologize. I missed that. I Who was a seconder on that one? It was me. That was you. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Thank you. With that, at 325, we are adjourning today's Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you, Dave and Rhonda, and all of the, the clerks and our security support and the CREATV time and all of the county staff and departments who helped today's meeting go smoothly and be informative and impactful. Thank you.